here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if you, for those of you who don't know me, feel very short. Um, uh, I'm Rachel Wolvers. I'm the adjunct faculty advisor here at Case Wester and works with Jolte. I am, I graduated from Case Law um, and was on Jolte back on volume three. Um, so I'm really excited um, to be here talking about volume 15 um, and all of the great work that Jolte has been doing. Um, so I was able to join our symposium last year. I was in New Zealand working on a Fulbright program, which I will talk about later, so I don't want to spoil all the fun. Um, however, uh, 2023 was a really interesting and important year for AI um, as chatbots and chat GPT really entered into um, uh, mass market appeal. Um, people became much more aware of AI and lots of other people started using it. Um, and so when we were talking about volume 15 for Jolte, um, one idea we had was to focus on AI and the different um, ways that AI would impact both the legal profession, but just really the law itself. Um, so today we're gonna be talking exclusively about AI, um, which is really great. Um, we'll have a few different panels. Our first one is about the legal profession and the li liability itself being impacted by AI. So when humans rely more and more on automation and AI, how do we ensure that the AI is making the right choices, telling us accurate information, and who should be liable? Next, we're going to hear from three speakers uh, uh, from the AI Alliance, including the National Science Foundation, the Cleveland Clinic, and IBM. And they'll be talking about how AI is changing, how we conduct the research, um, and the impact that the open source system can have on the development of medicine and groundbreaking technological research and how that will impact the laws and legal profession. Um, third, we're gonna hear from a really wonderful and interesting group of people to talk about copyright um, and art and creativity in AI, um, including ownership and copyrightability of AI-generated works. Um, Following that, we're going to have a little bit of lunch. Um, we're also going to have some really fun and interactive mid-journey um, demonstrations. I think we're actually doing it next door. Um, so you can grab your lunch and come make your own AI art um, and see what that's all about. And then we'll wrap up the day with um, a discussion of AI national security. I'll be joined by Adam from the Department of Homeland Security um, and a friend of mine, Chelsea who was a former CIA agent and then worked for Google um, and can talk about private public sector partnerships around AI um, and how we all should be thinking about um, the use of AI in national security and how to balance those interests in private and public sector working together along with other stakeholders. Um, so it's a, a very packed day um, and I'm just really glad that you'll all be here and I'll turn it over to Hunter, who's gonna kick off our first panel. And you have to introduce yourself, Hunter. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hunter Siren. I'm a 3L from Case Western Case Western University. Um, I'm the main editor on Jolte. I'm outside of Jolte and Case Western and the law firm that Stephanie was a favor and funding firm nationwide. Um, had the privilege of having a paper published by Guilty in this past issue. Um, the topic we'll be discussing today on um, the convergence of AI and the law specific to the legal profession. Um, beyond that, I'm excited to be here today. So, to introduce our panel, to my left is Mark A. Sayer and Kyle Lover. I knew I was going to mention that. So, we'll start with Kyle. Kyle Rich. Yeah. Todd Glover is a partner at the law firm Pierce Atwood LLP and an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. In his legal practice, Kyle leads the firm's technology transactions and outsourcing practice and regularly assists clients with a wide range of matters related to the negotiation of complex technology and intellectual property transactions in compliance with consumer protection, data privacy, and security requirements. Prior to entering private law practice, Kyle clerked for the Honorable Judge John O. Newman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit for the Honorable F. Dennis Saylor IV of the District Court for the District of Massachusetts. Kyle is a graduate of Harvard Law School 
and of the Fletcher Scott School at Tufts University, where he was awarded the Stewart Prize for Academic Excellence. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago. Anything you'd like to add? No, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark Asay, from my life, is the Center for Innovation and Privacy and Law Privacy Fellow for the University of Maine Law School, class of 2024. He focuses on AI, data privacy, and cybersecurity. Prior to law school, Mark served on the leadership team at Haven, where he designed and implemented underwriting algorithms for online lending. In his role as head of risk, in his role as head of risk solutions, he managed the company's product pricing, underwriting, reinsurance, and analytics function. He's a fellow in the Society of Actuaries and has participated in numerous insurance industry efforts related to the development of fairness criteria and metrics governing the use of AI and insurance. So then on Zoom, we have Nupor Amin. She graduated in lottery with a double major in information technology and economics from Rutgers University. Later, she per pursued law here from Case Western Reserve University and earned her JD. During her time at law school, she served as editor in chief of the Leaders Journal and interned at major tech companies like Beckton Dickinson. And Nupor has always been passionate about areas where law and technology intersect. Such as AI. Currently, she is a practicing attorney in New Jersey and serves as a trademark examining attorney at the United States Patent and Trademark Law. So, welcome back, Nicole. Glad to have you here. Next, we have Ian Maddox. Ian Maddox received his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies from John Hopkins University, where he concentrated in national security studies, including risks relating to nuclear proliferation, artificial intelligence, and dual use technology. Ian received his JD from the University of North Carolina, who served as an articles editor for the North Carolina Law Review. Next turn to the U.S. Court of Appeals, he completed coursework on AI and the law. Ian is currently a litigation associate at a New York based law firm. So welcome, Ian. And then finally, all the way from Western Australia, we have Helen Stamp. Helen Stamp is a final year PhD candidate in the UWA Tech and Policy Lab at the University of Western Australia where she researches concepts of corporate responsibility and accountability in relation to the development and use of autonomous digital systems. In particular, Ellen is focusing on corporate criminal liability in the testing and general use of autonomous vehicles and autonomous weapons causing a criminal offense. Ellen has practiced law for over a decade in a number of areas, including civil, lit civil litigation, community legal work, and as an operations lawyer for the Corruption and Crime Commission. Helen is also assisted in the prosecution of war crimes in the special war crimes scandal located in Sarajevo, and most recently worked for eight years as an advisor in the international human humanitarian law for Australian Red Cross. So welcome from Australia, Helen. So we're going to open with some questions. Um, I wouldn't start with them, but we're going to open with just a general icebreaker question, and it's. Basically, as generative AI evolves and continues to evolve, there has already been much debate and speculation regarding AI's future role in the legal profession. Some proponents, such as the company Do Not Pay, firmly believe that AI can eventually replace lawyers. Others believe that AI should have a very limited role in legal ethics and legal. What do you envision for the future of AI and legal? So, Mark and Kyle, and you can take us off. Sure. Can I go first or no, take it away? <laughs> uh, well, I guess my take on that is AI is here to stay in both the legal profession and so many other walks of life has, has become more complex and the number of powerful use cases that people will find for it grow. So I think it's here to stay and it will be uh, an essential component of the practice of law as it will be for so many other industries going forward. The real question is how do we use it in a way that's responsible, that continues to make it uh, make the practice of law overall effective and accessible, just transparent, which is a challenge, I think. Uh, so it, it's not if, but it's how to move. Yeah, the one thing I'd add is in my prior work uh, building underwriting algorithms, one of the things we realized was that algorithms would be really helpful for solving a lot of sort of core scenarios. The scenarios that we most frequently experience, the sort of majority uh, majority set, 
in the in the universe of data that could occur or scenarios that could occur. And so as we were doing that, we realized there would probably always need to be a human role in those more outlier or anomalous type scenarios. And so I think there could be some parallels there. And I think the question is, over time, we will learn better what are those easy scenarios for AI to help lawyers with? And then what are those scenarios where you, you absolutely need the kind of judgment and nuance that a human can bring that an AI may never really be able to bring? I think that figuring it out, figuring it out as we go to the like, fall part of it, there's a lot of mystery to it as to what you said, like what AI can do and what it's looking for us. Um, move forward, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it is definitely going to stay. And just last year when I was in law school, you know, we didn't have Lexus AI. And now I see that Lexus has come out with um, a sort of AI platform that students are not only students are exposed to, but lawyers. And these students are the future lawyers. So they are definitely more prone to being, they're more open to using AI. They're more exposed to it. So I think it'll definitely be integrated, if not already, into our, our profession. I can add something. I don't know. I couldn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, but uh, anyways, the yeah, so automation, one thing that just got me thinking about is just our AI class, our professor said to a room full of three L's as we we're about to enter the workforce that all, for year one to year five, they expect all of that to be automated in a several decades by AI or something, AI out to get your job sort of thing. I'm not super pessimistic about it. I think that there's some optimism here, like in the past with automation, with AI generally, like it has not resulted in wholly uh, displacing entire segments of jobs. And I think the biggest example of that would be uh, with the advent of the internet creating jobs you couldn't even imagine and types of work you couldn't even imagine doing. Uh, and as for AI and the actual practice of law, in particular in litigation, there's so many helpful tools that are emerging now, especially with uh, programs like Case Text and like Kara AI uh, that use like parallel concept searching. So I think that if anything, AI and the law right now is almost raising expectations and that you'll find the perfect case quickly. Uh, you'll be able to do it uh, you know, in a way that perhaps incurs less of a bill. And I think that that in a, in a way is, is raising the bar for practice of law and how that interacts. So I guess I'm an optimist, um, but uh, hopefully the first five years are not <laughs> wiped out. <laughs> so Helen, I know your focus is a bit different. Um, you'd like to explain your paper a little bit and how it ties to AI and Specifically, specifically for you, I was hoping to get your thoughts on the future of the law as it is applied to AI and automation areas in terms of like corporate criminal liability. Great. Thank you, Hunter. That's that's a big question for a few minutes, but I'll give it a go. Um, so as background, my paper looked at the Uber autonomous vehicle incident in 2018, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, where an Uber autonomous vehicle struck a pedestrian um, and unfortunately killed that person. Um, my paper looked at the police investigation. It looked at what happened with Uber as a corporate um, entity and it looked at the law and whether it was the law that was responsible for Uber not having any liability, was the law wanting and what I found was that the law in Arizona and the law across the US was consistently supportive of holding corporations responsible when there's a criminal offence of negligent homicide. So whether that's an employee or whether that's a member of the public. So the law was there ready and waiting. What I've learned from my research with the development of AI, the big tech companies that are developing it, is you also have all these other layers coming in that are leading to things like regulatory capture. So I've learned really that we need to look beyond the dazzle of this technology, the fact that we are slowly, I hope, learning that it's imperfect 
Um, the systems are only as good as the people who create, develop them, the data that goes into them. So I agree with my fellow panellists. It's here to stay. I mean, the genie was out of the bottle several, you know, a number of years ago. It's not going back. AI can be very useful, but we really need to balance that and learn, particularly as lawyers, that it is imperfect and look behind the AI to the corporations who are rolling this out without safeguards and holding those corporations to account, which in turn will hopefully develop better, more reliable AI. So that's what I'm looking at, um, looking behind this and realising that these systems do fail and they do cause harm. Thank you. So moving on to the next question, this is a bit more specific. Um, broadly speaking, how do you believe AI will affect or shift the attorney's role and responsibilities at the organization? So Newport, I'll start with you and you could introduce your paper at this time as well and um, kind of explain how that's connected. Yeah, sure. Um, so my paper is about um, an online dispute resolution tool. And what online dispute resolution is, is it's a branch of alternate dispute resolution um, where parties can settle a claim or an issue out of the traditional litigation system or the courts. Um, it originally started off with websites like eBay because people were just having a lot of um, small uh the fights over like small claims and so ebay could develop like the sort of um this platform that users can settle their disputes over but you know over time it has gotten to the point where in so there are two main models there's smart settle and family winner and family winner was developed um by researchers in australia um, originally to settle family law disputes, but the creators have since said that they it could basically solve any issue. Um, and so it basically those those systems have already used um, AI technologies. It's not a new thing that um, AI is you know can be a part of alternate dispute resolution or OD, on, or online dispute resolution. Um, and Smart Saddle is a system that that's used in Canada and Europe, and both of them have like various um, optimization algorithms. And so my paper just builds on their models and just takes um, takes what what's good with them. Like for example, a recursive method if you know parties can't reach um, a resolution, and then also with the recent breakthroughs with generative AI, I think that we can really get creative after, um, obviously there's there's proper oversight, but it talks about how we can sort of come to like create an ODR tool, tool that has a more mindfulness based approach as in you might be two parties, but you're, but this tool is already sort of encouraging the use of nonviolent language or like before you come into a negotiation you're taught you're basically prompted to do like a two-minute breathing exercise just to you know get get grounded and come into it with a more um, open-minded approach and essentially what we want is for these parties to reach reach a resolution um so it definitely gets creative but I think that is the potential of AI um, in the future. Um, obviously, Smart Settle and Family Winner have been around since 2000s, but they both have an option where you can escalate it to a human mediator. Um, and that's definitely necessary. I don't think that right away this AI can replace any mediator or arbitrator, but it can definitely um, start by aiding aiding them in complex um, uh, complex um, calculations for parties. Certainly. So, Mark and Kyle, I'll ask you guys a similar question. Um, but like in terms of the attorney's role and responsibility of representation, how do you think it's going to affect the attorney and client relationship and business like the advising clients on AI and liability? Um, this is a good place to introduce your paper as well. 
Yeah, so um, our paper has two primary sections. The first section looks at civil liability regimes and how they would apply to AI. Um, in particular, we look at the distinction between product liability frameworks and services frameworks. Product liability tends to be very focused on the manufacturer, or in this case, the developer of the AI and whether or not the developer made bad decisions in designing the AI. Where the services framework tends to be more in the negligence realm. So uh, as a result, under services approach, the focus would be much more on the user of the AI. And based on what we're seeing, it's unclear right now in the US whether or not AI would be treated as a product or as a service, which has big, which has major implications for who would be more likely to be held liable. Um, and so th that leads to the second part of our paper, which is the role that contracts can play in reducing uncertainty around that. So when a business partners with an AI developer to use or license the AI, the contract is an opportunity for the partners to reach agreement in advance about how liability will be handled. Um, but in that section, I think Kyle will probably talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, we also discuss the fact that other aspects of the contract are critical for making sure that agreements around liability are enforceable, right? Especially in the case where a user doesn't have the the deep experience or not expertise with AI that the AI developer does. And so the user may be in a very difficult situation in defending themselves if they don't have access to basic uh, data or background on the AI. Um, so I think tying that back to lawyers, I, you know, we think of lawyers using AI as just another kind of user. Um, in our paper, we do not we do not discuss the additional considerations for lawyers around ethical responsibilities and the sort of unique analysis of legal malpractice and how that might differ from a general negligence, a professional negligence standard. But we do think there are a lot of parallels uh, in terms of the, the need for lawyers as users to think in advance about uh, contracting around liability issue and other contractual provisions that would protect them. Is there time? Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So moving on to the next question. Um, generally, in what areas do you believe AI would potentially benefit or harm the legal field or more broadly the law as a whole? Um, I'll start with you, Ian. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, um, the the harm, I guess, the legal field. Uh, I know we'll talk about this later, but just, you know, AI is not perfect. Uh, the uh, recent uh, famous cases in New York, for example, involving uh, lawyers that cited to cases that didn't really exist, uh, that were hallucinated by chat GPT are evidence of that. Um, but I think that uh, what my paper really focuses on is uh, the importance of training data in making sure that like uh, algorithms are properly reliable and just i think that it's something that uh is an expensive and time consuming thing where an ai model and machine learning is only as good as the data you give it it's garbage in garbage out and i think that uh the quality and the quantity of the data is very important at the same time uh in particular for other settings that I think are a little bit different, uh, like in the healthcare setting or the forensic setting, which is a lot of the, the paper that I wrote focuses on forensics. Um, we also need to remember that even though it's the model that spits out the answer, it is a human that handles the sample. It is a human that handles the inputs that go into it. And if you give it something that's inherently incorrect, it can only do what whatever it can do like up until that. Point. And I think there's something to be said about the way people treat these models. And you can see it with that example in New York, like with the attorney that cited to the case that didn't exist, you, you rely on such things. You kind of give it this 
infallibility that I don't think it deserves entirely. And it's a tool that still needs to be fact-checked. And people, especially jurors, need to understand that when evidence comes out that's AI-based, it can't just be, well, it's a 75% that like X defendant is guilty. That sounds good enough. To, like it, it has to be more of a thought process here. And I think a lot of that uh, is going to require people to understand how these models work and to sort of make sure they're properly validated. That I'll jump off that. I think that actually uh, Ian's points tie back to the uh, question before too, which is how does this affect representation? Because I think just to elaborate on that a little bit more, going beyond the scope of our paper, but, but just thinking as a practicing uh, attorney, at the end of the day, from the standpoint of the recipient of legal services, I think nothing should change. There should be maybe more transparency around the use of tools. But at the end of the day, the obligations of the legal industry and of lawyers to their clients to provide quality legal services that have all the aspects that we hope a, ju a just system and a just industry would have, that, should, that shouldn't that should actually, if anything, that should improve, right? So we can't let automation and other uh, improvements in the way that we practice law uh, sacrifice or degrade the things that clients should expect from lawyers. Transparency, accuracy, fairness, due process, all those things, we have to make sure. And I think there is a need for all lawyers and for the legal industry as a whole to really be thoughtful about how AI, how AI is deployed. It's already being abused with the example that was cited. So I, I think that's an important uh, thing I 100% agree with. And just going off of that, I don't know if you're familiar with automation bias. The idea that when humans rely on machines, they, they tend to become more complacent. Um, just as a practical matter, moving forward as a legal profession, I think that we need to be more cognizant of or we need to be conscious of automation bias and big stuff to mitigate it, whether we build it into the professional rules or the training or something. I think that automation bias has shown its harm in other areas beyond the law. Um, for example, pilots tend to make more mistakes when they rely on technology simply because they become complacent in what the technology goes claim to the trust that it's going to work and make mistakes. And I think we could see a similar trend in the legal field, as we've seen with those attorneys in the field, with automation bias if we're not on the Anything else? Anybody else like that? Yeah, if I could, Hunter. Um, I think my main concerns with with the use of AI in the legal field is that it's consistently the literature and the studies are showing that obviously AI really can't match human decision making, human judgment at this stage. You know, particularly with autonomous vehicles, there are constant edge cases that you know, are constantly being generated and having to be dealt with. So I think we need to remember that, again, these systems, they still can't replicate the decision-making, the skills that an attorney would have and would apply. The other point I'd like to make is obviously thinking, I think, as Carl said, your client or, or the user of legal services, what are they told about this AI? Do they know it's not neutral? Do they know there's potential issues? So it opens up a whole field of of how you deal with that with your client relationship also. Um, and as Ian said about data being so important, a paper I'm working on at the moment brings in now these private companies or data brokers, for example, Clearview AI um, and Palantir, um, who are scraping data from the net and web crawling and then selling the data to companies who then develop the algorithms and the lack of accountability there. So it is concerning unless you as a lawyer can say, I absolutely know how this system works. I've had some form of certification from the company providing it to me. My question is, how can you be really sure how accurate that is, what bias it has? Um, these are all things we need to think about as lawyers. Ultimately, we take responsibility for advice given. And I still think that human judgment is is still far better than most of these systems at the moment. Certainly. We 
And so Ian, you sort of started to get into bias training data. And it's a known problem that the training data that you use to train our generative AI contains certain unintended bias. Is there any way you think that the legal profession could sort of mitigate these biases or be conscious of them as we start to try and adopt this technology into the legal profession? Yeah, I think that, um, well, just the general idea, just that it's not infallible is just very powerful because I think that that's something that uh, people want to rely on these programs. You type in a question and it gives you the answer and you just want to paste it in. Um, but I think that uh, the the other the other point I would make is just that the, like, I think that we should be concerned with just the fact that not that, especially as this like area of, um, as this area grows, just that it of how important how important the data is and how it is expensive and time consuming to get correct data to test it properly to train the machine learning algorithm to be accurate. That like there may be instances where businesses may cut corners. There may be instances where we need to make sure that everything is is working correctly. Um, but I think that one thing that I would add, like in terms of, and this goes into my paper specific, like specifically is just, um, I think that validation testing is is a very good way of making sure the algorithm is properly trained as sort of calibration metric to just make sure that uh, we're on track with bias data. And, um, and, I, and I think that in terms of like what the legal profession can do, talk about it more. There's not that many. So I, my paper focused on AI as evidence. There's like one article that's sort of like a, doctrinal coverage of everything like authentication of AI evidence, like expert Daubert standards for evidence. And it is written by a judge and I think like a two practitioners and then like a person that knows computer science. And just the truth is that judges, sure, there may be some, don't, don't usually get comp sci training, like, and same with lawyers. And I think that's something to just be wary of in this profession where there are a lot of humanities people, including myself. And it's like, to understand this stuff, it's it's just getting we don't need to know how to code but just generally understanding how it works is very helpful <laughs> yeah i think that dovetails with um i mean one thing our paper talks about which is a little more generic than the legal profession but i think it's true for lawyers and law firms uh as it is for anyone who's gonna consume ai that's developed by someone else is there's a need for uh diligence before you decide to procure the AI, you need to be educated enough about the risks and the way that AI works so that you can ask good questions. And I think what's going to happen in reality with a lot of consumers of AI is we're not going to have the leverage in a specific contract negotiation to change the way a vendor will actually do certain things. But a vendor should be able to answer basic questions before you make the decision to procure it. And I would expect that in the legal industry, as well as other especially in other highly regulated industries like financial services, uh, insurance, uh, other pilot uh, healthcare, that you will you'll see market differentiation. It's already happening. Like uh, Lexus is AI product and West, uh, uh, Thomson Reuters has one. They, they have a few actually. Precision, I think, is the legal research one. Uh, or it's part of their precision product. But you'll see those vendors trying to adjust how they're building AI, how their governance model for ongoing testing and validation of AI is structured to try to address the concerns that are hearing from the marketplace. So uh, being a thoughtful consumer and also being careful about jumping onto the bandwagon too quickly, or at least if you're jumping on in an early version of the product, making sure you've got appropriate controls human in the loop, human intervention, some uh, education about the appropriate use of AI for folks at the firm who are gonna be using it or in the practice. That's all super, super important. But I think uh, absent you know, some technological constraints that I think are real around that, the complexity and the difficulty of getting transparency for certain types of AI, we, I think we'll see a move toward uh, more transparency, more ongoing testing, more governance for certain types of use cases driven by the demand of communities like the legal community and also driven by certain regulators. I mean, in Europe, they're already trying to push, you know, maybe you could argue with how they're pushing, but they're basically saying, here are regulations that we expect everyone to comply with. Please comply now, even though you don't now. 
uh, police compliant uh, going forward. And I think that's going to happen, and that will also affect the way AI is developed. And I think that the education part of the attorneys, judges, and anybody in the profession can do. So, for example, in the paper, I cited this example of this judge in Columbia whose checks and he came to write a write an opinion that he didn't. This was like in the early stages of chat you can see that probably over a year ago. And just knowing the problems we know now in terms of like hallucinations and the bias training data and everything that we did it wasn't as prevalent as before. I think that educating attorneys to avoid stuff like that, especially now, is critical. So is there anything else anybody else would like to add to that? I just like to echo what everyone said and kind of, you know, I think it's very important that now we know that algorithms can be biased. There, there are, there can be errors and lawyers and judges, we're not developers. We're not the ones who are creating these algorithms, but we do have that power where we can give feedback and also like try to shape the policy and where the future of, of how we use AI goes. So that's, that's, a little bit of power that we do have. So, Helen, I'll start with you on this. So, with AI evolving and becoming more prevalent, there's this new question of how do we allocate responsibility and liability for AI errors? So, generally, how do you think we should start to address this? And over time, do you think that this is going to shift? Sorry, Hunter, was that for me? I couldn't quite hear you there. Sorry. Want me to repeat? If you could, sorry. Sorry. So essentially, gener generative AI started to evolve and become more prevalent. And there's this question of liability. And the question I had for you is how should we address this now? How should we allocate liability and responsibility now? And in the future, do you believe that should shift? Great question and something people are pouring over at the moment with how to do this. Um, I think what I've seen and, and how I think it probably should be approached is models of distributed responsibility or accountability. So looking at the systems, looking at the different parts of the systems. Um, for example, in the UK, they've recently passed legislation for autonomous vehicles where before a vehicle goes on the market, there's agreement between the state and the agencies who regulate and the companies who actually develop these cars. When the vehicle does X, this person is responsible. When this happens, something else is responsible. It's all agreed before the point of sale. So you have buy-in from the manufacturer and therefore liability isn't such an issue when it's actually there's some sort of accident as well. Um, so that's a really good model that has been developed, which I think is great. And I think it could be used more generally for other types of automated systems or autonomous systems. Another um, area that we're looking at in Australia and at the university where I am, um, Professor Band has developed a, what they call systems intentionality. So when you're looking at a corporation that may have developed a system and something goes wrong, we're always caught up with how do you actually prove intent by a corporation? It's, it's an issue that many countries struggle with. She's developed an idea, a concept where you look at the system, what was intended by the system, and then infer the intent of what the corporation was going to do. That's a very new model that's been looked at. So in answer to your question, Hunter, it's very much, I think, we can't just put the blame on the individual. We can't just say it was all the corporation, although quite often it is. Um, we need to look at it as a systems approach because these are systems, um, whether it's the data brokers, whether it's the developers, whether the corporation has rolled it out recklessly or in very minimal cases if there is some rogue employee who's done something to a system. So I think at the moment that's what we've got to work together. They're not easy, these, these sort of systems of accountability and liability 
but I think we need to work towards that um, at this stage. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah. yeah. Space has been moving forward with all the ministry. How do you sort of the budget funds on that? Yeah. Um, well, I'll I'll leave Kyle to talk about more specifically how to provide clients. But I think some more background that is helpful in terms of this question of who shouldn't be liable is, um, you know, some of the items I mentioned before around uncertainty, whether AI is a product or a service and how that ties in with current regimes. One of the things that Europe has done is they are in the process of revising their product liability law uh, in order to explicitly incorporate AI. But at the same time, they're also, Europe is uh, building out an AI liability directive that stands separate from their product liability law. Um, because I think that's, Europe has recognized that AI is complicated in terms of uh, how it might be used, whether it's embedded inside of a, a, a sort of what we understand to be a product, like an autonomous vehicle, or whether it's maybe more of a service. And I think generative AI used in the legal research and drafting is much more in the service realm. Um, and I think, uh, you know, also in the paper, we look at, okay, what are we seeing in the U.S. in terms of regulation? Um, and it's, you know, it's limited, but also strange. Um, in the U.S., the only laws I can find right now about this are a New York City law around use of AI in employment decisions, a Georgia law around use of AI by optometrists and ophthalmologists to perform eye exams. It's the strangest law. Um, and a Colorado law around use of AI in insurance, which is really sort of how my interest in this area got involved. And then just last week, Utah passed a, a more comprehensive uh, consumer protection law around the use of AI. I think what's important to note about all those laws is the common trend is that they are focused on the user of the AI and they assign responsibility and accountability to the user of that AI. Not, none of those laws deal with the AI developer. Sometimes that might be because the state can't regulate the developer. So maybe the state doesn't have the ability to regulate that sort of practice. But I think that's really important for lawyers to understand who are using AI is even if there's uncertainty in the civil liability regime, the regulations that are increasingly being passed in the U.S. are certainly falling on the side of the user, in this case, the lawyer, being the one who has the responsibility. Yes. And in terms of advising clients, um, I think you have to advise clients that there's a lot of uncertainty and I'm thinking about the client's use of AI if you're engaged to, to advise on that. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of uncertainty in what legal regimes will say about the ultimate responsibility and liability when something goes wrong in a client's use of AI. But there's a, a good likelihood that, you know, there's very high likelihood that there's some risk and exposure for the client and the client's use, even if uh, the vendor is the cause, or there's an argument that the vendor is the cause of the harm because of how they develop the AI. So clients have to be really worried and careful about the way that they're using AI. They need to ask a lot of questions of the vendor, partner with vendors who have good processes in place to try and give additional confidence that the AI functions as, uh, as advertised and will continue to do so over time. Uh, which is really an important piece about AI that it will, it could, depending on the type of AI, it could change over time without a human injected update to the AI. Um, and, you know, to the extent the contract, they have flexibility in the contract, try to allocate responsibility so that we can adjust for some uncertainty in the law. So, before I'll start with you on this question, since this ties in your paper on. AI proponents believe that generative AI will cause a leaping closing in the so-called breakfast gap by making legal services more, much more accessible. 
What are your thoughts on this, specifically in the mediation context? Yeah, so um, so these systems that I was talking about in my paper, Family Winner and Smart Settle, they're already sort of autonomous in that they don't need a human mediator to facilitate the process. The system actually helps uh, helps the disputants get through the entire thing. Um, but with that being said, there is an option in both of these systems where if you need the help, if you need an extra um, if there is a dispute that that reaches an impasse, it it has the options, but it, you can also go to a human mediator um, within the companies. So I think that it can definitely help in terms of accessibility and that people, it, it can be cheaper and cost effective um, to use these systems rather than, um, you know, go through the traditional system Um of litigation and of even a mediator or an arbitrator. But at the same time, the systems also had flaws where, for example, in Family Winner, it could allocate material items kind of easily based on which party value, what each party values more, but it couldn't um, really calculate what the kids might want or what the kids need. Um, so in that sense, there is a lack of, you know, these systems could potentially really run without any human um, interfering in the entire process. But would we would we really want that? Certainly, you know, it's going on I'm trying to think of a question about just knowing where it is helpful and wonderful. And I think with one limitation on closing the justice gap with AI is that it has its limits and it's still figuring out those limits, kind of what we discussed earlier. But I think a big part of it's going to be figuring out, you know, what's AI good at in terms of like mediating or like negotiating and you have to find the company and going in that. Does anybody else like to add any additional thoughts to that? All right. So the legal profession prides itself in being self-regulated. Based on our discussion today of the potential benefits and harms of the use of AI, how should the legal profession approach regulating the use of generative AI now and in the future? Kyle, any thoughts? Okay, I, uh, thank you. Uh, again, this, this goes beyond our paper, but I'll, I'll share my thoughts as a practitioner. I mean, it, it does seem like historically the way that the legal industry has handled changes in technology has been state bar associations or state uh, regulatory bodies who are responsible for the practice of law in the states come out with a range of different approaches. There could be model rules that are put out uh, as recommendations, but it has typically been state by state. And what I've seen in the, historically is kind of a uh, lawyers pay attention to the technology that you're using. You're responsible for the practice of law, regardless of what technology. So exercise discretion. Uh, and sometimes there's some requirement that you advise your clients that you're using it. But it's very kind of lawyers, you know, we're going to hold you responsible if something goes wrong, but you know, otherwise it's on you. I expect that will be how this develops. I'm not sure it is the right way for it to develop. Uh, I, I like many things in the United States, there's this tension between having the laboratory of 50 states doing different things and having some uniformity. Uh, AI at this point to me is, it's a tool. It has a lot of power. There's new risks associated with it, but I, I would expect that at least in its current state, we will see legal organization address it the same way that it has historically. Um, if it becomes something more than a tool that can summarize things for you or find cases for you, uh, where it's actually exercising judgment, which I don't think it's capable of doing right now, that might change everything. But that's not the that's not what we're dealing with right now with the way AI might be using it the special. No, I mean that's well basically the thesis of my paper that we need to proactively regulate this so that you can uneducated players who don't know that, how they're using what they're using from making mistakes that they don't even know they're making essentially. But at this time we'll take questions from the audience. 
So we talked, so Alex asked, we asked, we talked about the ethics of using by data, but Alex was more concerned with the ethics of where we get the data from. Do you have that yeah, I mean, I uh, this is beyond the scope of our paper, but certainly I, I think this theme is often referred to as data provenance uh, considerations, and I think there are a few different concerns. So the first is is was the data sourced legally? You know, and especially with the proliferation of data protection laws in the U.S. and, of course, in in other jurisdictions, um, there is a there is a big issue around the history of how that data was collected, when it was collected, and whether or not its use in training in AI was you know a use that the the person consented to, if needed, at the time of collection. I think. Um, one of the big challenges is that these systems have become so complex that often it might be hard to know to be able to trace the data all the way back to where it originally came from because over time it may have, may have been grouped together, purchased by different companies, and sort of lumped into one giant data set. And it might not always be clear, you know, how that giant data set needs to be divided in terms of assessing provenance. Um, so uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I know there is work underway to create more sort of intermediated controls on data provenance, sort of like, uh, what's a good example? Um, sort of these like, you know, think about the organic labels, right? Like this is sourced from an organic farm, like some sort of label that sort of indicates this data set, you know, has been checked and is good to use. And, and things like that. I know there's work on that. I'm not terribly familiar with all the details, but I think that is a big concern. Could I add something, Hunter, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I know that we've had the um, EU um, progress mentioned, which is, is really good, and the recent EU AI Act, which has been passed. And that's a really good act to look at in the sense of classifying AI into risk categories and and when they can be used and different risks. But also in relation to data, it goes into a lot of detail about the problems that can crop up with data and how these should actually be addressed. So it's a really useful piece of legislation to look at because the they've gone into it into a lot of detail and what what developers and companies need to look at. So it's a good example. Okay. Um, can you all speak to the idea of client uh, confidentiality for the I can share that it is on the minds of the companies like Thomson Reuters and Lexus when they market the products to the lawyers. And it, it's an interesting, I think the current approach that I've heard from the vendors who are trying to sell to us as lawyers is we will not use any input data for training purposes. So if I upload a contract that has client content information, I ask a question about it, it is, uh, the, the the AI is using, it's trained and it's tuned on other data, and then it's processing my request and looking at the contract that I've uploaded, but it's not actually going to ingest the contract itself for purposes of further training and tuning. And there's, in that scenario, it's like any other technology product in the sense that the vendor will have access to the, 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 the confidential information but it's only going to be used for purposes of providing services to me. They've got security commitments and confidentiality commitments that I have to make sure they've made. 
um, for now. But it's really an interesting tension because, uh, and others who are more technically uh, into, you know, up to speed with how AI works would probably have more to say about this than me. But it strikes me that that is somewhat in tension with the idea that we want the best product we can get because sort of the data maximization, data minimization uh, tension. The, on one side, it's like we want to be private. We don't want to use this data because we don't want it to be used in a way that would be inappropriate. We don't have consent for. That's data minimization, and most privacy regimes in the world are built on that, right? Uh, data maximization is the idea that for the best model, we need to train it on, yes, quality, but high, large quantities of quality data. That's how it become the most, the most useful, most accurate, most robust tool for us to deliver the best thing that we can deliver. Those are intention, and I actually don't know where that's going to end in the legal profession. Um, I suspect the legal profession is going to remain fairly conservative there for a variety of reasons, not all of them good. But I think from a client confidentiality standpoint, right now, that's where we are. I don't really see that shifting in the future uh, any, anytime soon. Maybe. We have time for any additional questions? All right, the one which is closing thoughts. Yeah, there's no good reason for closing thoughts. Would anybody like to give them a closing thoughts? Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I suppose closing thoughts are that to approach AI in the legal profession or anywhere else with a healthy dose of scepticism. And as uh, Mark and Carl have said, as professionals, ask questions, um, use your own judgment. Um, it is here to stay. But I also think as a lawyer myself, having worked in a research team with, with data scientists and computer people for the last three years, they've been very patient with me, but I really think that the disciplines need to learn from each other. I think it was we've mentioned already with judiciary, but just as lawyers ourselves, um, we need to have a basic understanding of what's happening with this stuff and the potential problems. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I guess the, the only closing comment I would make is, as I mentioned before, the liability issues around AI are rapidly evolving. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, under sort of uh, common law areas, but increasingly, you know, regulators will tackle this issue. So I think it's critical for lawyers to be constantly looking out for changes in the landscape around liability, uh, because otherwise, you know, the risk is quite high that something gets missed. Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining. Everyone smile on Zoom. <laughs> All right, y'all didn't see that. I forgot. See you guys. Bye. Thank you for having me. <laughs>
I we have Wendy from NSF, and then we have Josh from IBM. Um, so I'm just going to take a second to introduce myself along with all of them. Do you know a little bit about their backgrounds and the things that we'll be talking about? Um, I am a, I'm Gianna, I'm a third year law student here at Case, um, focusing in the area of health law. Um, I currently serve as the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Law Technology and the Internet. Um, before coming to Case, I, my background is in business. I did undergrad and grad school um, in business management with a concentration in international business. Um, so a little bit of a switch to the health law world, but I love it so far and I'm really excited to keep going. So now for the panelists, we first have Dr. Jay Hai. She is a professor of neurology at the Cleveland Clinic Learner Caller of Medicine and Chief Research Information Officer for the Cleveland Clinic Health System. In this role, she works closely with information technology, research, finance, and other departments to organize and optimize the Cleveland Clinic's digital infrastructure and computational research strategy to better support research activities and accelerate new treatments for patients. She is the principal investigator of Cleveland Clinic's biorepository and the executive program lead for the Discovery Accelerator, which is a strategic partnership between Cleveland Clinic and IBM to accelerate research and innovation, leveraging high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. She is the vice chair of the Cleveland Clinic's Institutional Review Board, chair of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Computational Life Sciences, and chair of the Cleveland Clinic's Data Advisory Council. She chairs several key commissions in national and international professional societies. She has more than 190 peer-reviewed publications, 10 book chapters, and is a regular reviewer for the NIH study session. In addition to her medical training at epilepsy, she holds a master's degree in healthcare delivery science from Dartmouth College. Next, we have Wendy. Wendy is the Deputy Division Director in the Information and Intelligence Systems Division of the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Director at NSF. Previously, she was the Lead Program Director in, in the SMART Health Program. Her division's work focuses on the intersection of artificial intelligence, data, and human users. In addition to her work at NSF, Wendy serves on numerous federal and international technology missions. Prior to joining NSF, Wendy was the National Institute. Wendy worked as a National Institute of Health. And lastly, we have Joshua New. He is a technology policy executive at IBM, where he leads IBM's policy work on generative AI and open innovation, and senior fellow of the IBM Policy Lab. Josh has helped launch the AI Alliance, an international community of 85 plus leading technology developers, researchers, and adopters collaborating to advance open, safe, and responsible AI, and serves as co lead of the AI Alliance Policy Working Group. Prior to IBM, Josh was a senior policy analyst at the Information Technology and Innovative Foundation Center for Data Innovation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank studying the intersection of technology and public policy. So, as you can see, we have very vast experiences here from all three of our panelists. Um, so, we're going to go ahead and kick off some discussion now. Um, we'll start with just kind of a general icebreaker question and go from there. So the first question is, what challenges have emerged in integrating AI into scientific research processes? And how have you all addressed these challenges, um, both at like an institutional and broader level? Dr. Shida, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> Happy to kick this off. Uh, first, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Um, I know I've gotten to know Josh from the AI Alliance. We work with together on the policy uh, subgroup, and uh, I also am on the steering committee for the Alliance. So uh, we're definitely very excited about this, and uh, we're heavily engaged in it. Uh, I, I, it's been a couple of years since I've seen Wendy. I wish this would be <laughs> this would have been in person, but uh, it's so. Um, yeah, uh, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. So let's start with the problems. <laughs> the challenges that we've had. Um, the integrating AI in biomedical research, this is the path I've been waiting in this discussion. 
is a promise that we've all been looking forward to in the research community for a while. We've all reached um, sort of our tipping point with how much the discovery can accomplish with the traditional approaches to compute. And we've been looking for a new approach to compute. The other challenge that we were hoping to solve with AI is the fact that our data that we are using now for biomedical research is just growing exponentially at a pace that we cannot keep up with. If any of you imagine, you know, there are many young people in the way, even young people go to the doctor every now and then. If you, <laughs> if you go to the doctor and um, they see you, they usually end up ordering a bunch of tests. Many of these tests may include getting images, pictures of different parts of your body, blood work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, studies now that use genetic data, uh, biomarker data. So the types of data, the complexity of the data that we're dealing with, and the scope of the data has grown um, way too much. Um, to give you a sense, in the pandemic, the research data that we were using 10 years ago was in the scale of, you know, a couple hundred terabytes. Right now, we are handling 15 petabytes of research data, and we expect that just next year to go up to 18 petabytes, the year after 24. These are our projections based on this exponential growth in the amount of data that our research will have. So you have on one hand the promise of innovative compute technologies that AI can offer. There is the substrate for these technologies to work on, which is all the data that is now available. But the challenge that we face in between these two is uh, providing efficient mechanisms, both on the technology side and on the regulatory side, to make all of these data sets available to the technology. We spend most of our effort curating the data, just figuring out how to pull it from its sources and uh, massage it, make it, uh, shape it in a way that the compute can have not. Actually, just the compute itself, um, doing writing the code, running the analysis, this is about 10, 20% at most of the effort that goes into AI and biomedical research. The 80% of the effort goes into getting the data to be ready and going through all of the regulatory requirements, the committees that need to review, the data governance uh, review that needs to happen, the approvals, the, uh, making sure that privacy is protected, that the right people have access to it. This is where we are spending our time. So for me, as a, now the voice of research in the community, um, that is the main challenge, handling the data and going through the regulatory process. Thank you, Wendy, Josh, um, either one of you, either of you like to share some of the challenges that you perceive? So I'll, I'll go and I'm sure Josh will go then too. Um, I just wanna echo the data is a huge issue and um, remember often your compute colleagues, they're not just coding people. Um, they have careers, they need to publish, they need to publish in very different places too. Um, I think it's like, you know, law and health, you don't publish in the same place. You, you don't, when you partner, you don't publish in the same place. So spending 80% of your time getting data ready is a very ineffective way. Um, and also we end up seeing people using the same data sets again and again and again. Um, and this is just ineffective because if you look at the compute world, there are so many areas where there is an amazing amount of data available that we can't get young people interested in this area because it's not it's not cost effective for their career. So um, I think it's a real like if you look at astronomy, who's put all their data together, um, you can astronomy has become a data science. It's an AI field now. Um, you look at many of these fields and you go, oh, they've actually managed to put their data together. Health has just not done that. And that is just such a damaging aspect for this because um, there's so many people would love to change these aspects and make it easier for people to 
understand and access this information, but without without consistent data and high quality data, it's a it's just a real challenge. Yep, and uh, just to add really quickly, um, I think I'll given that I am not a a scientist myself, I'm more focused on the society scale public policy angle of this. Um, I want to first of all echo what my co panelists said. I think these are very major challenges, but. From a, a, like a fundamental point of view, I think um, barriers to entry to actually using AI in, in a scientific context for scientific research is a pretty critical challenge, um, especially in the wave of AI and especially especially when we're talking about generative AI and foundation models. Um, I think AI is a technology that lends itself um, very naturally to centralization. Um, you need a massive amount of compute power of uh, extremely uh, in demand uh, human capital and, and skill sets, you need access to very rare and, and often expensive to uh, obtain and, and clean and prepare data. Um, all these things make it very difficult for people to uh, really take advantage of AI to its fullest potential, unless you are at a leading research institution with very large budgets. Um, I, I, I'm not personally involved in solving that challenge directly, but something that you know we, we created the AI Alliance for, which you know happy to say the Cleveland Clinic is a member, CDI is a member, and, and NSF is a is a collaborator, a fellow traveler in the space, is devoted to making these barriers to entry significantly lower um, by by sharing tooling, data sets, uh, testing and evaluation toolkits, and models themselves out in the open. Um, so this does not solve all of the major systemic and institutional problems related to using AI for good in a scientific context, but eliminating that first hurdle, I think is a really, really critical step here. So let's turn this a little bit into the role that you all see of these open source technologies and evolving into when it comes to scientific research, um, particularly in the context of an AI driven innovation. What do you perceive the future of that? Sure. Uh, I'll just build on my first answer to realize you may have jumped the gun a little bit on the conversation, but um, okay. I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, so I just laid out, you know, the, the, the case for, for lowering barriers to entry in the context of open innovation as it relates to AI. But I think to, to build on that, take it one step further, um, AI is like an extremely competitive landscape right now. Um, people are jealously guarding models. Um, access can be very expensive um, to do sort of cutting edge AI work at the, what's considered the frontier level, there's like five companies doing that, right? And, and that'll change over time as compute costs go down and, and this becomes a little bit more democratized. But uh, if we get a lot better about sharing access to these kinds of resources, it just think imagining a world where people are competing based on how well they use AI, not just on how well they can sort of like jealously hoard the resources necessary to build AI. I think that is a dramatically different landscape, which is much more prone to much more distributed and beneficial innovation in a scientific context, uh, but like shifts the focus of where people are are spending their attention. It's not just on on accumulating like a like a dragon, like as much compute as they can, but but actually doing this uh, or using AI in a useful context. I think is um, the world I'd like to be in. I just want to add to that, you know, medicine has not been an open source world, even before AI. So the incentives are misaligned for that, really. I mean, it's it's pre-AI. <laughs> I've been talking about this for as long as I can remember. So, um, you know, we have a lot of incentives that really, that hoarding everything, hoarding data, hoarding models, hoarding artifacts, all of this. It, um, is there, but also when you bring in the regulatory perspective, there's reasons, you know, regulatory processes are not cheap. So, you know, when I, I did an open source project with a, with an industry consortium at one point, uh, and they were like, if you make it open source, we won't partner. Um, they didn't want a high price on their, on having it accessible, but, but they didn't want it open source because, because of all the challenges they would face going forward. So I think there, we think about this, but this is not an, this, this is not an AI problem. This is really a healthcare medical problem that we need to get past, um, a, a siloed approach. I, I have to echo, strongly echo <laughs> The, the comments that both Wendy and, and Josh made, it is, um, you know, it is much easier in medicine. When we uh, think about sharing data, typically the fourth comes in when we have to decide if this would be considered human subject research 
versus not, meaning is the uh, data set that we are using, including uh, protected health information. So information that is directly related to a human being. And if so, there is a whole ad additional set of layers of complexity that we have to go through versus when it is non-human subject research. Um, for example, the whole field of astronomy that uh, when they really came to, that is the example of, okay, it's now an AI field and they figured out how to work together. Well, yeah, because there is no human, all of astronomy is a non-human subject research topic, right? So those are much easier uh, to deal with. And from a, let me make it a bit more practical for the audience. Think back to when the pandemic happened. I know we all like to forget that time, but humor me <laughs> for just a few minutes and think back to when the pandemic was raging at the beginning of it, when we really had no clue how to contain it. And we were uh, reaching for straws, right, to keep this contained. And there was a chance to do that by having people share their locations and whether they are, you know, positive or not, so that you could um, do that, um, you know, the, the social uh, isolation better, right? And the, the containment better. And uh, many countries were able to do that very effectively, and they contained the spread of the pandemic much more effectively than we did. Uh, in the US, we were never able to do that because that was perceived as um, you know, not acceptable. And people, many people, uh, are very, at that the same time, were very comfortable sharing their location for restaurant suggestions <laughs> or, you know, for uh, the weather, where they're going, or for many things, right? But somehow sharing that piece of information for health purposes was not acceptable. The data for health information about how we're doing, we're healthy or not, what kind of diseases we have, uh, what um, medications we're taking. Uh, that's very sensitive. And people have different um, layers of acceptance for uh, their willingness to share. And it's a very sensitive topic. I hate to go there right away, <laughs> but at the score, really the reason why we haven't solved the data issues with tests it is that because as a healthcare system, our obligation is to the patient. We can never do anything that the patient is not comfortable with. And the patient is not one of the patient. Those patients are along the whole spectrum that you saw, uh, you know, divergent tests during the pandemic when people on one end, extremely, extremely supportive of sharing all their data, let's put it all out there, let's figure things out, you know, let's make things happen, and innovation, right? And then people on the other extreme who are much more for concern, cautious, protective, um, wanting to protect the uh, information, and there is no right or wrong, it is just a reality that we have to deal with. Yet, on the receiving end, there is only one set of laws that applies to everybody. One registration form that we use in the healthcare system to uh, for patients to sign up, you know, for us to be able to deliver care for them. Um, and that doesn't account for all of that complexity and the variability that's on the back side. So this is only the regulatory complexity of it. I'm not speaking about the business of healthcare. Uh, the, uh, the monetizing value of data that many people are worried about, the how do we generate um, you know, enough return on our investment and collecting all of that information. There is all of that complexity um, that I think Wendy was alluding to when she was speaking, and all of that is very real, and all of that 
is very uh, important uh, in the installment of that. But even if we check all of it, in its core is this issue of the complexity of the varying privacy expectations on the from the patients from all of us, uh, and not enough flexibility on the regulatory side to be able to act on it. Thank you. That was a really good point. I guess in my mind, I never really thought about the, the values of every patient kind of use such a broad spectrum of information and how that how that breaks down. So that was kind of amazing. Um okay, so the next question is are there specific areas within scientific discovery where AI has shown a particularly promising result? And where do you see the greatest potential for future breakthroughs? Um, Josh, you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, and I, I want to uh, apologize to Dr. Jaheen Vance that I, I, I'm, I'm also most fascinated with um, AI in a healthcare context or scientific discovery. So I'll try to compartmentalize some of my comments to avoid stealing any thunder. Um, I, I think um, the drug development life cycle is like extremely uh, ripe. We're already seeing the benefits, but extremely ripe for like a massive amount of transformation in a positive direction through AI. Um, and, you know, this was true, like pre generative AI chat GPT world. Um, but I think it's going to be even more true now. Um, and so the, the drug development lifecycle has like five distinct stages. There's discovery, preclinical research, clinical research, uh, FDA review, and then FDA post-market safety monitoring, which is like a forever ongoing thing. Um, and, uh, every one of these stages, I think AI has like pretty enormous, um, transformative potential. Um, and, and we've already touched on some of them, but uh, just at a, like a super high level view, um, discovery at the first point, you know, you can leverage AI to simulate and predict and model, you know, thousands of models or thousands of different molecules a second, um, understand their protein structures, what their function might be, what their toxicity might be um, to like dramatically increase screening um, of potential target molecules, a process called high throughput screening. Um, you could take advantage of unstructured data in a way that you couldn't in the past to get like better signals about molecules that might be promising targets for medicine. Um, for, for the clinical research stage, I mean, clinical trial operation and design is one of the most expensive parts of the drug development process um, and leveraging AI to do like better patient recruitment and engagement um, better remote monitoring of patients so they don't have to make like expensive and, and time consuming trips to uh, to clinical trial sites. Um, a, a, a myriad of different ways where you can actually make this process much more efficient, much more successful and much less cost intensive. Um, the FDA is piloting AI driven techniques to do like real time monitoring of, of uh, clinical trial information. Um, they have an oncology specific program um, that can reduce like drug approval time from years to months based on analyzing this data as soon as it comes in. Um, and then post market safety monitoring, right? Like I think there's enormous potential in uh, natural language understanding to review consumer complaints, to understand sentiment, to understand what people are talking about online globally, to incorporate that into like a much more holistic view of, um, you know, how we understand drugs are, are safe and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing. And just like a, the, the case for optimism here, right? Like this is of course not the only reason healthcare is so expensive in America, but a major cost for sure is how much it costs to actually develop a drug. Um, Statistics will vary depending on whether it's like a first in class molecule, what you're actually targeting uh, with the drug, but it can range from like $314 million to almost $3 billion. Um, and this process can take like up to 10 years in some cases. Um, if we can reduce that by like 30%, uh, which, which is I think a very conservative estimate uh, based on the power of AI, based on improving all these processes, um, I, I think that would be enormously transformative for healthcare. We'd have more drugs on the market faster, safer, and for less money, um, which is great all around. Wendy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I guess um, outside of health, it's made huge transformative differences in so many areas. If you think about precision agriculture, which didn't exist five years ago and is now a thing around the world. Um, this is a huge area, but but so many, I, I mean, I must say most of the sciences have been transformed already um, and are really doing this. But I, I think pharma is one of the places, and I agree with Joshua, that 
you know, even thinking about automated labs, right? You know, why do we do what we do? We have people with test tubes and we have people with, you know, uh, you know, putting in little amounts of things where we can, we can roboticize this. We can use AI to monitor processes. We can cut timing down so much. And we're seeing these developing now. Um, and I think this is going to make a huge difference, not just it's not just timing, it's efficiency, right? And, you know, poor graduate students, um, you know, they can do better things than just be playing with a test tube. Um, but, you know, we can think about speeding up this process, making it more effective. You know, when you're using AI and you run analyses in real time, you can make a very different approach. Um, and you think about this and you see this in Europe where a lot of uh, where, where AI has also been used in different ways where you're seeing outcomes start to change. So, um, you know, I think that, that, that we're seeing this make it into difference in many, many different areas. Yeah, lovely examples by, uh, you know, Josh and, and Wendy, uh, uh, the, the drug development uh, is, is the most obvious one. Uh, for sure, the only thing I might add to the whole cycle that uh, Josh outlined is this whole discipline of drug repurposing that uh, is getting uh, a lot of attention now. So drug repurposing means you're not discovering a new drug, but you're discovering a new indication for an existing drug. So um, it, that is a um, very efficient uh, way of at least identifying some uh, potential applications, new applications for drugs on the, that you can bring to patients. It cuts all that time that goes into the development. You still need to go to the clinical trials to confirm that, you know, for this hypothesis that you have for what this drug can also do is correct. So you still have to go to the clinical trial phases, but all the years that go into the target um, identification and developing the molecule, you can cut those. Um, and that there is a lot of work happening at the FDA. And all that there's a lot of research going on around it. RFH just announced a big initiative, one of the uh, bigger the grants supporting a uh, startup and uh, partner organizations to do it at scale. Based, and AI is the way uh, that all of that research happens. You basically take all the molecules that are uh, approved or that have been tried and you simulate what kind of um, uh, structures they can bind to and it concludes from that the kind of application at that end. So, um, it, it, that is a, a different way of how we used to think about developing drugs for our patients, and uh, it is very strong. What are the ethical considerations associated with AI driven scientific discovery? How do you navigate these considerations? Sure, happy to. You know, there is an obvious sensitivity and an obvious concern that our community, our patients uh, have uh, when, particularly in healthcare, uh, when it comes to AI. Um, you know, doctors went to medical school to work with people, you know, with patients, and patients go to see the doctor. Um, you know, they they trust that physician. Now they all go to Google and have a time. <laughs> they come with what they found, but that's different, you know, from um, them accepting uh, treatment recommendations, and and that requires that human trust. There, healthcare by its nature is a very human um, field, so. Um, applications of AI that may be totally acceptable to people who go for them without even thinking in other disciplines uh, are a lot more sensitive when it comes to healthcare and healthcare decision making and interactions in that context, right? So there's a lot of ethical concerns that stem from that when it comes to autonomy, um, decision making and respect, right? Like just those fundamental principles. Um, 
typically when we talk about ethical concerns in AI, we like immediately go to validation of the models and biases that come with the models, and how when they develop to reflect the innovation inequity, disparity, and, and all of those are very correct, of course. Uh, what I'd like to draw attention to though is this other ethical concern related to um again the, the core, the essence of integrating, you know, the in a way um I'm putting aside this piece of my human relationship with the patient and uh, giving it to an example of it. Uh, it. It's a it's a topic that we don't talk about often, and and I think it deserves a lot more attention than it does. Wendy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to add I, I I totally agree um, with what's been said before. I mean, this is such an important area. It's such an important part to keep in mind. And it's also something that I feel like um, the the research community really needs to to focus on because it, it, when if, if it's if there's just a profit incentive, it becomes much more challenging to keep this front and center. Um, you know, we we now are focusing on responsible AI. Um, which has the ethics component, but the fairness component, the trust components. Um, I think it all just it's it, but it, but it is an area that is, is is very challenging to balance because we as humans have all these biases that we don't we're not aware of often. We're not, um, and that's baked into our data. I mean, you know, we laugh about it now, but. Um, when when we first started using computer imaging to you know computer vision to classify images, if you asked for a kitchen, it always came with a woman. And you went and you know people looked at this and and you know it, now that it's it's been people have addressed it, but you know it was it was it was it was a bias that was baked right into the data. So these are things that we have to keep working on thinking about, and it's it's I think. We have to keep balancing these things because it's the human is have the biases too. So we can't just say, I can't use AI, it has a bias because it's learning from us. Um, and, and so the problem is at a different level, but it doesn't mean we can't learn from each other, having the diverse voices in here from diverse disciplines, but also diverse communities. So I, I want to. Uh echo that uh, as strongly as I can. Um, this is a concept we, before I worked at a think tank where uh, we, we called this concept data poverty, where, you know, in an increasingly data driven world, if you're not represented in the data sets um, that are used to make these decisions, these decisions are much less likely to benefit you. Um, and I think in like a scientific context or in a, in a healthcare context, right? Like if we're using clinical trial data to develop predictive algorithms about, uh, you know, what, what drugs are likely to be effective and safe, um, we know uh, women and minorities are dramatically underrepresented in clinical trial data um, for myriad reasons, but drugs have actually been pulled off shelves despite being initially approved because they found out that they were like extremely toxic and, and producing, uh, you know, an unacceptable rate of side effects in women, um, just because we had this major blind spot in our, in our, in our data. Um, and so I think as AI becomes more central to all these processes, um, being mindful of, of, you know, it's only as good as what goes into it, um, and and making sure that these processes are inclusive. Um, not that we should, again, have, you know, bias is always going to be a factor, and we, we shouldn't, you know, issue these technologies. But making sure that these are inclusive and representative processes as possible is the only way to make sure that these benefits are going to be broadly distributed. Wendy, I have a question more specifically for you. Um, share in what ways has the NSF supported AI driven scientific discovery, and what are some notable outcomes or milestones that have resulted in that? So NSF has been supporting AI since before AI wasn't cool. Um, remember, we go back to the, we go way back on this. I mean, this is not a new topic. I don't can't remember whether it was 60s or 70s, our first award, but AI is not, we've had an AI winter, we're in an AI summer now. Um, hopefully we can stay in summer for a while this time um, so that we can get the full benefit. But um, it, it, NSF's been funding that. We have 
We have many, many efforts that cross these areas. I actually led a program called Smart Health for years um, th that really was to bring the AI community and the biomedical community together because um, I started this when I was at NIH because what we saw was a lot of advances happening in computing did not cross into the NIH world, um, you know, but it also didn't cross because they were the wrong problems. So um, computing people, it's hard to work with biomedical people who speak a completely different language. They publish in different journals, which you know, my folks would say the wrong journals, but they're the right journals. You have to have these, build these relationships, right? Computing only publishes in conferences for the most part. That's not the way the biomedical world works. So you have all these huge cultural differences, but you actually have language differences, you know, trying to, um, when we first started this, a long time ago, I remember having an argument in a public meeting where I was saying, uh, I was saying, somebody was saying ground truth. And I was like, ground truth? Are we really, can we just talk about gold standards? And they're like, we're not talking about money. We're talking about science. And I was like, you know, but in the biomedical world, there's very, you know, truth is hard to come by. Um, used to be dead, not dead. I think we have a middle category now. We always laugh about that. But, you know, in computing, we're always looking for that, that for that truth. Um, but when you start to put these topics together, it takes a while for people to develop the language, develop the understanding. Um, and frankly, everybody's busy, careers are on the line. This is hard. So we we try to get it that people are, because if you partner together, we're solving the right problems. Um, and if you're solving together, we can also get over the hurdles between agencies, between funding, um, and honestly get to FDA. We've had projects now that are through the F. We just had one that I believe finished FDA um, in anesthesiology that we funded way, way back when it was just algorithms. Um, but that one went to AHRQ and got funding to do the first pre-post trial on it. Then it went to NIH for a clinical trial. Now it's finishing, if not finished or finishing FDA. Um, we're super proud of that, but that was the right team, the right problems. Um, and, you know, I think the right teams with the right problems is how we get to the super amazing finishes. Yeah, this one is, you know, so for you, how has AI influenced the landscape of the science of discovery when it comes to areas of, like, disease diagnosis, treatment development, and patient care? Well, um, I, I think my answer would, would bend on what Gwen said. She really has, it's, it's a pain that only the people who go through can <laughs> Related to that, what she's speaking to about bringing people to speak different languages and having them work together. And uh, the example I used, you know, my experience with that pain was with launching this discovery accelerator partnership with with IBM Research. It's a, it's a big deal for us. Uh, you know, ten year relationship. We are carrying their researchers with our researchers and our projects, um, AI, quantum, you know, other things. But uh, I've gone through them with the same experience that I've gone through with any other technology partner that you work with, which is you put the computer scientists and the engineers on one side and the biomedical researchers on the other side, and it's like one group only speaks Chinese the other only speaks German, and you're asking them to generate the document in English. It's so difficult for them to communicate and align and, um, you know, find those common goals. But then when they do, that is goal. And it, it's exactly as when you said, you know, having, finding the right team, we find the right problem, it's a, it's amazing to watch when it happens, actually, but it is so painful uh, to get to. And the way AI has transformed the landscape is by making us realize that that pain is worth that benefit. Um, it, they, the way we do biomedical research now, because it is so data heavy, 
um, it, it research, biomedical research now is happening a lot more often in front of computer screen than it is in, um, you know, web bench labs and um, in front of patients. And don't get me wrong, that part is of course still happening, but before uh, AI became as popular as it is now, and before we had as much data as we have now, um, going through a postdoc training or uh, learning how to do research on what you have to learn was how to run my experiment in the lab and then how do I you know, talk to patients or um, uh, look at images and such. But right now, you cannot publish pretty much in, in, in high impact academic journals on the, on the medical side. You cannot do high quality research without being very bad with um, computers. So most of our labs now in the Learner Research Institute and the clinic um, have hired, they, they have a computational scientist embedded in the research team. So it physically, it physically has transformed how our teams are with that computational expertise is now essential to the success of any uh, biomedical uh, research lab. It is essential for us to be able to publish. It is essential for us to get grants. Uh, it is making us see how important it is to really have those, um, you know, alignments and those conversations and, you know, learn. And it goes both ways, right? So the biomedical people have to become more familiar, at least, with understanding the language of compute. But the right team that when he's talking about is when it goes the other way too. When you have the computer people, the engineers, who also have that flexibility to want to understand that biomedical system. Can you share any specific examples where these projects or initiatives has really impact research outcomes of the clinical clinic? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, the programs that we have going on now across um, our innovation district. So the Indian Innovation District is this um, a big initiative that's supported by the state and, and Charles Ohio started in 2020. And they're co-investing with Stephen Clinic um, and partners across the city, including Case and UH and, and others. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to transform treatment into an innovation district anchored around biotechnology. So there is a, a physical signature, I think, you know, physics coming up uh, <laughs> because of that uh, innovation district. And so there, there are teams being created, right, to, to do the work. And there are technology companies like Canon, uh, like IBM, like Aventa for our biobank, many companies that are moving into treatment uh, to be a part of that innovation district. So with all of that activity, uh, we are seeing an exponential you know, growth in our research outcomes, our publications, our uh, you know, discoveries. So it's a very exciting time to be in treatment. Josh, I have a question, maybe a little more specific, but you answered, how do you ensure that the benefits of this AI-driven research are accessible and equitable across diverse populations, you know, including the underserved uh, communities? Um, man, if I could answer that question in, in like five minutes, that would be incredible. Uh, this is an enormous challenge, um, right? Like this is something that is uh, mainly being driven by the profit sector, largely with a strong profit motive. Um, uh, when we're particularly talking about model development uh, at, the, at the at the frontier level or at the cutting edge level, um, every step of this process is enormously expensive, um, has very high barriers to entry. Um, I've alluded to it as well, but I mean, I, I think creating like a very robust sort of open innovation ecosystem is the, if not the solution, but it is the like critical first step to the solution. Um, I, I I cannot really envision a world in which these benefits are broadly distributed that isn't like built on a foundation of openness. Um, and this is not just people open openly licensing models, right? That they can share model weights and everyone can access them. Um, it's 
a culture of sharing. Um, as, as Wendy was mentioning earlier, there's a lot of sort of institutional pressures to not share um, data or, or models. Um, there are uh, kind of unusual regulatory pressures to, or, or lack of pressures to not share the results of federally funded scientific research, although that is changing based on some actions from the Biden administration over the past two years. Um, there are cultural challenges. Um, there are uh, scientific integrity challenges where um, people are, are reluctant to share their research because it makes it easier for people to poke holes in it or identify bad research. Um, if we can make marginal progress in, in all of those categories um, to make sure that uh, there is like a really easily accessible, robust uh, community or, and, and pool of resources for uh, skills development, for education, for actual uh, technology itself, these models and, and toolkits and testing environments, um, that would be a tremendous playing field leveler. Um, to make sure that people who are motivated to do this can can get involved much more easily. Um, about how the benefits are distributed um, is, again, a, a very tricky challenge, um, especially when you have profit incentives involved. Um, I, I could talk all day about what I think might be helpful here. Um, but uh, other things that I think would help uh, and, and to, to give kudos to the NSF um, for uh, the, the National AI Research Resource um, is a uh, yet criminally underfunded uh, but ambitious plan to uh, create a pool of public computing resources that can be used for development, for testing, for distributed access to do um, this kind of scientific discovery that makes this technology uh, and, and uh, the benefits of it within reach to communities, um, you know, uh, uh, a university that might not have a particularly well-equipped compute lab, for example, to do this kind of research um, in a way that can be um, much more uh, broadly beneficial than, you know, it going to the highest bidder, for example. So for me, Wendy and Dr. Jing, I think answer, how does AI really impact the FDA's approval process? And what are kind of some of the implications for ensuring safety and efficiency of new treatments or technologies? Um. I can't speak for the FDA, but I will say that AI has, you know, if you look at the regulatory process, it's always been built on stages and steps. Um, AI has, by definition, um, built into it, it's a perpetual growth, right? So as you add data, as you add information, this is a challenge. Um, we talk to FDA all the time about you know fundamental models and how do we think about the foundational science in here and what changes and what doesn't but as we've seen with you know as you see in the common press all the time uh, models go off the rails right we don't understand what the guardrails are on a model um you know that's one of the issues with the with the models available now is nobody's really sure what they were trained on, what are the limits, what are the requirements in those models. Um, and when you don't know that, you don't know when it's going to go off the rails. You don't know when's going to happen. We are seeing a lot more models being built. I know, Joshua, it, it, it's hard to build them, but we're seeing a lot more models happening at, um, um, you know, has, a, a, they're coming up, you know, and the universities are really investing in this. So um, I think there's opportunities for that. But um, I think with it just this adds a whole new challenge when when you have a system that can continue to grow past the approval date, past um, the evidence that was used to support it. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with Wendy. So uh, there is if you think of an equipment, which is a drug that gets approved, that makes it to the market, there's a whole framework for how we need to do post marketing. Surveillance and you know, marketing research to keep track of it. But we don't really have that with algorithms. Yet they are much more likely to change and you know go off the rails in you know using Wendy's term than a compound that was just made and was not going to, you know. So um they we don't have that framework. And um that is uh so that's the negative, right? The the risk. But there is also an opportunity that we're missing on because um, of the regulations being so rigid with the FDA with once you have approval that's it, it's 
Um, if you want to change anything with that approval, you have to go and repeat your clinical trial. So the equivalent of that, think about it, you know, as if you, you know, you can update your phone whenever Apple or whomever, you know, comes up with an update. Stick it, and then it updates overnight. And you know that any point in time, you are using the most current version of that technology that there is. In my field, uh, I'm an epileptologist. I take people who have back seizures and do brain surgery to stop their seizures. And sometimes there are devices that we implant in their brain to uh, stimulate, regulate, you know, that brain electrical activity. These are devices that were developed, went through clinical trials, and were approved. There's the one of them. It's about 10 years ago. In those 10 years, we collected a lot of information with all of that electrophysiology data that we collected. Uh, AI has allowed us to develop so many algorithms that can help with predicting seizures or the delivering therapy based on what it is getting. Um, none of those algorithms can now make it into those devices because they were not part of that original approval and the company uh, basically would have to design a whole new clinical trial so that it can even test whether uh, these algorithms are effective or not. Of course, they need to do research to figure that out, and we shouldn't just like slap them on. But at the same time, to bring them every time there is a new development to ground zero, you have to start from ground zero all the way up. Uh, that is very expensive. And that is very complicated. And that is holding us back. So we are in healthcare because of that limit with uh, integrating algorithms into uh, devices, into wearables, into um, a delivery uh, a care. Uh, that uh, it really has slowed us down. The FDA is aware, of course, and many conversations happening with them. And right now they they are taking steps in the right directions. For example, they came up with this uh, recent proposal for if you know ahead of time what changes you are going to make along the way, you're allowed to make those changes without having to go through reapplying for a new approval. So that's encouraging, but in science we don't really know all the changes we want to make along the way ahead of time. So it is still not uh, getting to across the finish line, but it's a step in the right direction. So we are just about out of time, but we can maybe take a question or two from the audience live or in the virtual. I mean, how's the question for anybody? In virtual? No. Does anyone have any final shots? Any final thoughts that they would love to share? Wendy, <laughs> um, Josh, or Dr. Jai, just in closing. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share a quick thought. Um, I, I think this discussion here today highlights, I think, some of the uh, myopic perspective that a lot of lawmakers might have around what are the most pressing challenges in, in AI um, around, around scientific discovery. Um, one of the things that's been keeping me extremely busy and things you may have seen in the news are concerns around AI safety, um, which is sort of like this new bucket of concern that is is uh, an extension of the ethical, responsible AI conversations we've been having for a couple of years. But this idea that um, the, you know, the increasing capability of AI could lead to some really scary um, outcomes for society uh, that cause serious harms. And one of the examples that I think is, is identified as... Um, more concrete by policymakers, particularly the Biden administration, is uh, sea burn risks, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear risks um, uh, exacerbated by foundation models with dual use purposes, so civilian or military technologies. This is a long-winded way of saying that there is a, a very major thread of concern uh, in DC about how the same uh, advances in AI that are letting us predict new molecules as drug targets could also be used, for example, to develop a new biological agent that hurts a lot of people. And this leads to motivations to restrict access to these models, um, you know, uh, 
criminalizing the act of, of sharing model weights above a certain capacity threshold, for example, is one of the policy ideas being floated. Um, and it's not that policymakers shouldn't care about that kind of risk. That's, of course, their job. They want to make sure everyone is safe. But it, like the distance between that and all the problems that we talked about here today is, is vast. Um, and I think the problems we're talking about are very tangible and very real and leading to real world harms already. Um, and so I, I would hope that if any one of the audiences is particularly motivated to call their lawmakers, um, that you know you you urge a little bit more nuance and balanced perspective here. It's it's not that you can't focus on these big picture safety risks, but there are a lot of more nuts and bolts challenges um, that we need to address before we could ever hope to make progress anywhere else. And I just I will just add I think that there's a lot of opportunities. I think when I worry about safety, there is so many issues of safety that are really mundane in AI right now. Um, we don't, we, the majority of AI, you know, in health, we do a better job of testing these, but, but we're still not fully testing them. Um, so much for being sentient, we're not even smart most of the time yet. So, um, you know, we really do want to think about how do we build these communities that can really evaluate test. And I think it's all about building the communities and, and together. So that's it. Uh, if we can just take a quick picture for people on Zoom to just smile for a second, we'll take a little panel picture and then we'll wow, Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Thanks all. Bye. Oh, man, it's great. It's just a plus two. Uh, thank you Bye. so much. Did you get a, I don't even need this other folder. You know? I I I'm You don't put the name. Oh, we signed our own place. And then yeah. I didn't even need to, that was like uh let's say I'm like you will sign very familiar. <laughs> Yeah, we're in traffic. Yeah. 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 the room has good microphones. Oh, yeah. I love that. 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 I love Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, there we go. Wait, we just talk and I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our mics are on. Or I'll just give it like a hey, Everybody, want you to start it in like uh, 45 to 60 seconds. Exchange numbers. <laughs> All right. All right, y'all. Appreciate you sitting around and your attention throughout the day. This panel is one that um, I'm actually passionate about all these panels, but you did a phenomenal job setting this up. I have Gianna and the rest of the team. Excellent work. Thank you so much. Well prepared. Um, but yeah, we covered some really important territory, but I think this is going to be 
uh, I think this is going to be one of the most foundational ones in a way that we may not yet appreciate. We're seeing in the world that like an extension of some of the pain and some of the confusion and some of like the disorganization of money to people that happened when we went to the digital world in terms of people that create music and manage the back end of it and consume it. And so now we're going into a space where, and I think Aileen will give us a, a great description um, of, of a concept for it, right? Where the, the nature of what people create and the nature of what artists put into the world may itself change and how do we make sure people have good lives and how do we make sure we understand the implications of that for like the trajectory of humanity. And so with that, I'll briefly introduce myself and then pass it around to folks uh, to introduce themselves for a few quick minutes and then we will get rolling. But I am Austin Carson, founder and president of CAI and a fortunate co-worker of Rachel Denzel Igor here. We're doing a great job, thank you all. Um, and we are a nonprofit advocacy organization that is designed to help communities all gain the benefits of artificial intelligence in a way that is um, self-determined, that is based upon conversations with people and based upon building on the capabilities competencies and experiences that folks already have. And then translate that into something that uh, Washington, D.C. and other local governments, state governments can use to evaluate kind of the full spectrum of issues and risks from like, local and personal all the way up to existential and the trajectory of humanity. Yeah, yeah. So our belief is that artificial intelligence um, policy and artificial intelligence as a consideration is becoming everything policy. It's just like computers, it's getting baked into the world, except for all the places where computers stopped because things had to be with them. Now all the rest of the fuzzy intuition stuff is on the table. So this will be transformative, make no mistake. Um, every indicator that we have says this is an unprecedented economic, social, cultural, and human experience. And um, today itself, some of the some of the main issues with information reliability, research, and use of agents were solved. So 56% accuracy rate just went up to 96, so by the way. Anyways, with that, I will pass it over to Aiden. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm an artist, writer, and curator, um, and most of my work has been sort of digital art um, and technology. I graduated from the University of South Florida with a BFA in studio art and a BA in philosophy, and then went on to get my master's degree at the Pacific Northwest Public Art in critical theory. I've since spent a lot of time working across various galleries and museums, doing work um, predominantly the Whitney Museum, the Vicenna, the New Museum, specifically the Eiffel Museum. Um, and I've spent the last few years working more closely with decentralized apps and blockchain based technology. Um, and Aileen is, I think, something that you'll hear a lot more of, just becoming like a curator. Curator, I'm excited to be talking about. Next, we'll, pack, we'll pass it over to Professor Michael D. Murray. Steam Professor, please, sir, introduce yourself. Take us away. Well, hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be uh, virtually attending your conference here, and especially on this panel. So, um, uh, Austin did a nice write up in the program, or whoever wrote that up. Uh, so I won't belabor the details. I am an artist and an art law professor. My specialty is copyright and right of publicity law within art law, but I do write and publish on all areas of art law. My interest was drawn, obviously, to generative AI even before the release of ChatGPT3, which blew everyone's mind and mine too. Um, but I was looking at the earlier versions of Stable Diffusion and the other truly generative AI products that we're using transformer models and diffusion techniques. So I have researched uh, the issues of copyright infringement in separate works. Um, and, and I've written to the Copyright Office and their gathering of comments. So I am one of those critical 10,000 comments they uh, have received uh, on the issues. Today's topic is about authorship. And of course, authorship is connected directly to the concept of copyrightability. And that was what my article was about. I believe in a short sentence or two, the Copyright Office has definitely gotten the wrong end of the stick on this one. They are denying you, all artists, your copyright ability and authorship over the works that you create using these powerful, fantastic AI tools. And uh, until we get this sorted out, there's this giant question mark about what is, are your works copyrightable? Are they just complete public domain? simply because you didn't use the algorithms in one type of program, but you use the algorithms in another. 
And uh, and that's basically, I'll leave it at that. We can move on. Great. Everything with clone brush is off the table forever. Yeah. All right, Jess Myers, please introduce yourself. Hey, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. This is an awesome panel. Um, so I'm Jess Myers. I'm senior counsel at Chamber of Progress, and I'm also an adjunct lecturer at Santa Clara Law, where I teach the business, technology, law, and policy of AI. Um, prior careers that I've had, I've been studying the, in, the internet law, internet policy space for quite some time. Um, I used to work for Google, both in their trust and safety department, and then I was a senior policy analyst and government affairs uh, uh, an analyst as well. Um, on their team, I've seen pretty much seen it all when it comes to U.S. intermediary liability. Um, generative AI, similar to uh, Professor Murray, it, just, it, it was another uh, evolution in the internet law and policy space. And it's something that I became very interested in given the user-generated content aspects of it. Um, and I know we'll talk later about sort of the differences uh, between this technology and the internet. Um, so that's that's sort of what uh, attracted me to this, this space. Um, I'll just note Chamber of Progress is a left of center tech industry coalition devoted to a progressive society, economy, workforce and consumer client cl uh, climate. We back public policies that will build a fairer, more inclusive country in which all people benefit from technological leaps. And while many of our corporate partners develop and implement AI technologies today, they do not have a vote or veto over our organization's principles. Well, I'm glad to hear that until Adam got it. Um, okay, so we'll kick off with, I think, maybe, uh, at least for me, what is the foundational question, right? Which is that kind of how it applies to all the rest of where AI is touching the world. But I think, I forget who made the joke. They're like, yeah, we didn't like to say to call out like the human soul first, you know, and save that from us. Um, and we think a lot of times, at least as I've considered it, you know, artificial intelligence in some way is a mirror of self that allows us to consider how we think and how we are in the world and how our minds work in a way that we haven't really had before. And prior to that, art was the closest thing that we had. It was the closest thing that we had to abstracting out something into a melody or into a harmony that meant something to you and to the person that created it that allowed you to see past that. Kind of like, yeah, who knows what they think you feel scared. Yeah. And so I think compared to every other technology that's made music easier to produce or that's made it easier to produce digital art, those removed different aspects of what used to be the mechanical expertise in creating something, the mixing of the paint. Right. Um, how is AI different? To what extent do you believe that it's different? And is there anything about even my concepts and like framing of this correct? I'll start with Aileen and like you go since I think you got the most fulsome and uh, perhaps on the ground approach to it. And then we'll turn to Michael after that. Aileen. You put that so poetically. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love to start with a quote from one of my favorite artists working with project with project. In a condo, um, she stated at one point that, in a sense, you could argue that all art is artificial, always has been, because of the fact that it is a construct, a representation of our reality, right? And that was the case for painting um, when realism really came to the floor. Um, and people were really afraid if you look at cinematic history of like initial films, everybody ran out of the theater like saw. That like first film of like the train coming towards them, if you really felt like that was real. And I think that it is at the root, like that's the fear of every new media technology, every form of art and creative expression that it comes to the core. Um, that fear that, you know, we are going to be um, subsumed by something we can unable to distinguish that construct from our reality. And I think with AI in that sense, it's no different. Do you think that like, um, do you think that there's something about almost like the differential, I guess, and I don't, the, what I mean by that is almost like maybe the um, volume and quality of those things. We will talk about kind of how deep they explain this a little bit later. Yeah. Um, but do you think, and I won't make you expound me on that, but do you think that that is going to make this meaningfully different or that we will adjust to the increase in volume and sophistication that I think we live rather than this? That's a really good question. I think because of the increase in volume of cultural artifacts that are being produced today and kind of like overtaking the internet to begin with, I think there's this really strange statistic out there that like in 20 years or so, 
like more images on the internet will have been created by artificial intelligence. Right? We, we um, so given that, like, so okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, given that fact, um, I think that we are going a bit slower to adapt to this new. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Get wacky for a second. All right, Michael, please tell us what we're missing here. I do appreciate starting at such a high intellectual level and uh, even philosophical. The uh, I would say the big difference is that really grip my mind when I think about generative AI is the infinite variety that it puts in the hands of artists who are going to use these tools. It used to be, you know, you had to you had to study a whole lot to figure out how to move into a new genre. You had to study a whole lot to move into a new medium. You know, when you're switching from watercolor to acrylics, it's an easier step than switching from watercolor to oil and so forth. And and with, with this, you can just say, well, today I'm going to do whatever you want. So it's kind of freaky, fascinating, wonderful. The second thing is the speed. You know, you, it's, you know, as an artist, it takes so long to create works. And I know part of the joy is in the process itself. But uh, but it's still the speed of the tools are amazing even compared to digital algorithm tools that we've been using for 30 years or 40 years. The, uh, and then the, I think the bigger concept is the democratization of creation that these tools allow. This also, you know, is two, this is a two edged sword. It's, it's democratization. It's wonderful, right? People can self-express, self-actualize, do things that they couldn't do before visually and communicate in ways that they could never do before because the tools are so readily open and available and usable and they produce stunning results, not just, oh, it produced a result. Um, on the other hand, it does, as we've said, as Eileen, as Aileen pointed out, it's likely to dilute the art market. Pretty obviously, we're gonna see it more and more. Maybe someday we'll see it was a tsunami and we just let it overwhelm us. And that can have many consequences, obviously, if it dilutes the art market. But the second thing is the tools still require imagination. They require inner vision. And I have a feeling, and probably it's not that illogical a feeling, that it's going to eliminate the incentive to study art because these are so open and available tools that anyone off the street from any level, from any walk of life, from any prior background can walk up to and access uh, it, and it, it's the, the, the difference of where you get your imagination, inner vision, I'm afraid, is, is going to be compromised, perhaps, by the speed and ease with which these tools are. So I think those are my two main points, or several main points. Okay, sorry, I just realized I'm incredible. I can't tell you guys it's a trade secret for me and Aileen's new startup. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so I think that you raise, I think, one super interesting point about uh, the democratization of creation. Think about the internet. You know, if you think about the internet and what it did and how we kind of viewed its value, with the, it was the democratization of consumption. You know what I mean? It was the democratization of consumption and distribution. And so the democratization of creation, I think, is a far more interesting question for its impact, to keep it philosophical for this first question. Um, and then I think uh, there's another question that I... Do you think is worth considering it is like the joy of the long process of creating a work of art one of the artists we work with ray crocker who's been on some other panels and done some things with us he kind of demonstrated his workflow and it's kind of got this like a uh, multiverse of madness thing where he's like right here's the image i'm starting with like infinite permutations i'm scrolling through them super rapidly this is my favorite that's kind of wild to work with you know it's like very interesting all right so anyways we'll, we'll like take it down to earth slightly and Jess, I want you to maybe kick off a conversation with us on like, you know, and Michael, you broached this, but like really what should perhaps be copyrightable in this new world, you know, and how, and are there ambiguities in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I agree with everything that my co-panelists have said so far. Um, I will say this just to, before we get into the copyright discussion, one like tiny point of pushback, and I'd love to hear more from Michael on this. Um, at least from my experience, I am not an artist. I will never be an artist. I have absolutely no artistic bone in my body. So I have a lot of respect for artists. Um, I feel like from what I've used with Dolly and some of the AI image generators so far, 
I think there's a huge difference between the art that I produce without having studied art at all um, versus somebody who has extensively studied art. Um, there's sort of the imagination component, but then you also have to know what to prompt the uh, the bot with. And so, you know, I've seen some artists who are now specializing in AI art and they know sort of the, the lingo and the style and what to ask it versus, you know, someone like me who's like, draw a plane in the sky. So um, I, I don't know necessarily if it's going to have, you know, cause folks to not study art. Um, it might change the way that we study art, but I definitely think that there is still a lot of value in knowing how, you know, knowing how to be a professional artist, um, even with these tools. Um, that aside, so talking about copyright, I'll give like a very quick primer. Um, so copyright protection is automatically secured upon creation of an original work fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Now, Section 102 of the U.S. Copyright Act actually lists several types of uh, works that are copyrightable, and that's things like literary works, musical musical works, motion pictures, um, sound recordings, etc. Um, your texts, I always tell my students, when you text back and forth with each other, depending on the, you know, if you send LOL, that's probably not copyrightable, but um, to the extent that your texts are sophisticated, that's copyrightable. Um, you automatically get it when you create that work. Um, almost everything on the internet is copyrightable. You know, there's some things that we accept are in the public domain, but there is a lot of uh, independent self-created original works fixed in that tangible medium that are copyrightable. Notably, ideas are not copyrightable. And I will even go as far to say style is not really copyrightable as well. Um, and this is really important when we're talking about the AI space, because with AI, there's a lot of litigation taking place against the generative AI companies um, that have a lot to do with uh, style and ideas. You know, we've got artists who come in and say, look, um, we don't like that certain users can put, do the style of Sarah Anderson's work, for example. Um, but again, there's really complicated copyright questions around that. Um, we also have fair use, the concept of fair use, and that's really important as well. It puts sort of a limit on what uh, on the copyright uh, regime. Things like are like transformative uses, for example, um, works that are used in education and in teaching, works that are used for commentary and criticism, parody. These are works that you know we do not consider well. They, they're copyrightable when folks use those works for those purposes. We don't consider them um, infringement, copyright infringement. So that's sort of the lay of the land when it comes to copyright. And when we go into the AI space specifically, we then ask, does the current copyright landscape ad adequately address generative AI technologies? Or is there something so special, unique, and different about generative AI that demands changes in the copyright, uh, the current copyright landscape and law? Bringing all of this together, when we're talking about what is copyrightable for generative AI, um, Michael touched on it exactly. There's this, the, the overarching question is when you have an AI generated work, is that copyrightable? Now the US Copyright Office said recently, no, it's not. It's AI created and we only really recognize human created works. But I think there's a really important sort of nuance that's not really being considered at this point in time, which is how much human effort goes into creating some of these AI generated works. You know, the one that was the, the, uh, the art that was um, at the issue with the cop US Copyright Office, allegedly that artist had over 600 different prompts and spent hours upon hours creating that art. And the US Copyright Office said, nope, it's AI generated. You know, to me, that seems to cut against what copyright law was entirely invented for. At the same time, I also agree with Michael that there's the other side, which is if everything that's AI generated is considered copyrightable, then are we going to dilute the uh, entire space of art with AI generated works that may not be as deserving of copyright protection? And when we dilute the market, um, not only does it, you know, create all these random art works of art, um, but then we also have to struggle with the question of copyright infringement. And at that point, you know, almost anything, everything could be subject to infringement, um, which could be very stifling for artists as well. So that's sort of the push and pull that we're dealing with currently with generative AI and copyright. I love it. You ended up so casually. But like, that's pretty much all. <laughs> that's the push. That's it. You know, Easy. So, okay. So, I mean, I think this is going to be really uh, annoying statement to everybody who's been thinking about privacy at all, especially, or anybody's been thinking about patents for a while. I mean, copyright 
has been almost like, I mean, this is weird to say, but kind of like a straightforward, simplistic thing of like people that own different parts of rights, just like holding guns against each other. And then artists being like, I guess we're the tools of some of those people unless we're really rich, you know, um, which has been great. But I think if you look at how patentability has gone, especially as like computers themselves and the Alice decision have gotten into it, I wonder if like there's a need to even think differently as much as there'd be great resistance to the paradigm of how we consider distribution and allocation of rights. Like there's one thing about, and I don't want to get too far off into imaginary things, but um, at our South by Southwest panel, uh, Laurent Crenshaw, who's the head of public policy and external affairs, maybe for Patreon, and I discussed this idea of you know, maybe there's like a, you know, they were talking about a proportionate right, and I've been thinking about it more as like a probabilistic right, something about like, you know, how do you take individual or joint probabilistic representation of something, which I think in, in the ways is described as like, you know, flavor or taste, I think on the individual or perhaps macro level, right? And so um, it seems like we can't really writ large without anything about the IP industry, because it would be both destructive and like impossible, you know, but at the same time, I've been thinking about something like sound exchange, or instead, it would be like an AI exchange where people could experiment with different models, you know, on a private basis. Right now, like UMG and Google and all these other folks are putting in very high level private arrangements about how to license and distribute funds to the artists. And so, I mean, tell me if you agree, but it seems like there'd be great value in allowing artists as collectives or even as individuals to come together and figure out, okay, how do we want to, now that what we create is something more like ferial and like uh, like uh, algorithmic itself, you know, how do we do those rights? Like, do you think that we need to have like an experimental space to figure that out on a more private basis? Or is this the kind of thing that people are just gonna litigate out forever in case Western law school will like octuple in size because we'll have now like an extra trillion copyrighted images, you know? I don't know, anybody thoughts, feelings? If not, we can just do on. You guys can listen more South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. Jess, you don't want to run the AI exchange with us? I was going to throw it to Michael, actually, just to speak on like the value and benefit to artists. So I'd love to hear more from him on that. Um, I will say, you know, I think uh, having an experimental space, I think, would be great. I think the thing to keep in mind here is, um, you know, any policy that is sort of considered uh, we have to keep in mind the smaller artists and the smaller companies that kind of start up or are starting up in this market. Um, licensing regimes, they can be, as we've seen in prior with, you know, non-AI technology can be very stifling as well. So, um, you know, I see, I see value in it, but, you know, to the point that that would be sort of mandated in any regard as part of policy, um, I think we would have to be, I, th I think we'd have to give it closer thought. Yeah, just for your comfort, at least from CDI's perspective, like our concept is that this would exist as something that's for like largely consortia of artists, smaller to medium notoriety artists who could get together and be like, okay, we have X super fans and value. And instead of it being like UMG and Google, how can it be like us and Mid Journey, you know, or maybe Google ideally, you know? Um, and then if value comes out, we'd have policy conversations, but otherwise it would be like, yeah, question. Michael, what do you think? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's really a really interesting question. The, uh, uh, and I'm not quite sure where I come down on it. I mean, if you're, if you're asking about the, I don't think that your question's premised on the artists whose work has been freely available on the internet. And mm -hmm. then the result is that it got scraped and it got, and the metadata from it was used to build the, the weights and to build the stuff that's in the uh, training data. Um, if you're talking about something different, then, you know, how do artists who are using generative AI or how do artists want their work to be compensated because they want to make deals similar to what these uh, major media companies are making deals with open AI right now, then I think then, yeah, collective action is the way to get the weight to negotiate um, those kind of deals with generative AI, people who build the data sets and then who then run the the AI systems out of the data set. And as I've said in, you know, art law class for many, you know, many, many moons, the, uh, what you can't do in copyright, you do in contract law. So, you know, you write your contracts in the form of licenses or, or in just a basic, you know, we're going to have an arrangement so that you can accomplish these things. And that leads to the next great avenue we haven't even mentioned today, which is surprising, which is the metaverse. 
and crypto world where blockchains are kind of the way to do collective action in a very open way um in the queer way that transparent is defined in crypt in the crypto world <laughs> the way that transparent is actually just pseudonymous but um but you can do your collectives there you can fractionalize ownership in art you can create systems that automatically pay artists uh, a percentage or however you define what the compensation is going to be. And uh, all of it's done through first contracts. You figure out the structure and then you put it into the blockchain format to make it locked into the chain. So, uh, and then I guess that's it. Maybe that isn't it. You can ask a follow-up for, for sure, but uh, um, I'm happy to elaborate more on any of that. No, that makes sense. And I think talking about like the Web3 component may position to alien that you think that you're thinking about may be relevant. And actually I'd like to tag on a question for you as well, which is like uh it seems to me that there is only so much like there is a bizarrely zero sum game when it comes to like the monetary pie, right? And expansion. I mean it's part of the idea that changes the expansion of potential overall so there is going to be bigger, but like looking outside of just raw checks, what yeah. type of value do you not receive from the ecosystem and distribution of your and others art? That you would like to receive that may be folded from some action like this. Yeah, I think Michael brought up actually a really good point about like the blockchain and decentralization, um, the possibilities that that really opened up for secondary market royalties um, being distributed to artists sort of automatically and to pivot that into the sort of artificial intelligence conversation. Are there ways for models that were trained on my work to kind of like automate? payments to me when that model is being used or trained on say like major ad tech games for the Super Bowl. Yeah, and I think that's something that's supposed to what Patreon is trying to do specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we'll have to make sure we figure out we can make that more useful. And so let's maybe um pivot towards like major actions, either their opportunities kind of in these private uh, arenas or perhaps like legislative or governmental actions. What should people perhaps be paying attention to, like very specifically, if there's like one thing to pay attention to, what should you care about right now that hasn't already been mentioned that I understand about? I know my, it's hard out there. <laughs> no, but um, I think that hasn't already been mentioned. And then is there something that you think is a red hair? You know, is there something that people are talking about all the time that we should like redirect our attention? Yeah, so I'll throw in a couple of points here. Um, so the US Copyright Office is currently taking, uh, I believe they, they just closed their their comments period, but they were taking comments um, and inquiry on um, you know the U.S. copyright space and whether it is adequate enough to address generative AI, um, whether there needs to be a amendment to the U.S. copyright laws um, and fair use specifically. Um, I think that question is going to continuously come up, um, not just with the U.S. Copyright Office, but I believe, I believe we've also seen some hearings within Congress as well. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a red herring. I think it is important to think about um, the, how the current copyright space applies to generative AI technologies. But I will say that I think it's a very dangerous way of pursuing policymaking by doing it as a technology-based uh, uh, amendment. It's how we get very rigid laws. I mean, the current U.S. copyright law is extremely rigid in itself. Um, and so I think... It, AI is new. This generative AI phenomenon is new. Um, and I think policymakers are sort of rushing to do something about it. But I think it's what a better approach would look like is to do something that is technology agnostic. And then just and again, to start with the question of do we need to create new laws because the technology is new or is there a specific harm that's new that our current laws don't address? And then the second thing I would say is worth paying attention to. Um, we're seeing a reemergence of publicity rights laws. So this is the um, idea that separate from copyright in a lot of, we don't have a federal publicity rights law, by the way, but in almost all of, I think all 50 states, we have, they each have their own publicity rights statutes. Um, and this is sort of the push and pull between our, is your likeness, is your voice, um, your sort of your identity, your persona, um, do you own a property right in that itself? And in some states it's treated as privacy right and other states it's treated as property right. In California, it's treated as both. Um, a lot of other states treated as both as well. Um, but there's always been sort of this tension with publicity rights doctrine and copyright doctrine. Um, because we have a federal U.S. copyright law, uh, you know, we always are looking at does the copyright law preempt the specific claims or harms that are being brought under a publicity rights statute? 
Now, what we're seeing today is a lot of states, Tennessee is one of them right now, uh, trying to expand their publicity rights statutes to then also cover generative AI, generative AI technologies in a way that might actually bleed into copyright policy and fair use. Um, so we are likely, we, we saw something called the No AI Fraud Act come up in Congress um, recently, again, that uh, it, it sort of stepped on the First Amendment and fair use aspects of copyright law, but then couched it under this publicity rights uh, uh, claim or framework. Um, what I told the Tennessee legislature about, you know, a couple of weeks ago about their uh, Elvis Act is what they've called it, where they wanted to expand voice. Um, and they also uh, wanted to add a point that developers of generative AI that where their technolo that technology is used to replicate voice, um, those developers would also be liable. I simply pointed out, look, all of these states, most of the states already have voice in their publicity rights statutes. You can add voice as part of your publicity rights statute, but when you go the extra step to say now anybody who develops this technology, um, if it's used by a malicious actor uh, who replicates, I don't know, Biden's voice, for example, to give bad voting advice, um, you know, putting that back on the developer uh, seems to be something that would be very stifling. It would, it would really hurt innovation, folks would be less likely to create these models and these technologies anyways. So again, I would say, you know, keep in mind sort of this bleed between uh, publicity rights law into US copyright law um, and how we have to be thinking about, again, do, are these amendments and changes really necessary for the technology today? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I really, you know, Jess, you would have a remarkable way of summing up so many of these big ideas into the small piece. I wrote the the nutshell on right of publicity law, so don't get me started on right of publicity law. But if I will start a little bit on right of publicity law, it is it is true. There's so much more attention on right of publicity law. I think because deep fakes is start to be considered to be a topic of right of publicity law, and if it is, then the regulation of deep fakes is going to lead to the creation of legislation. Maybe we'll finally get that federal right of publicity statute, and maybe. And will it be privacy based? Well, OK, that would be a, a switch from the trend of the last six, 70 years. But uh, if it's privacy based as opposed to monetary property based, then, yes, we'll have to monitor it. Because as Je as Jess so aptly said, the minute you start moving your area of law and expanding it into a new territory, you are going to run up against copyright and the First Amendment. And, and I don't know that legislators are as sensitive to those things. I know, of course, First Amendment is a constant uh, discussion point. But when you do roll back one area and give room for a legislation piece that criminalizes or creates significant penalties. And, and again, the second thing Jess said that you everyone should in this room should pay attention to is if they are putting the onus and the liability, particularly criminal or, or the, you know, significant civil liability on the creators of the AI platforms. I mean, game over. This is it's the exact wrong thing. And it, it is part of the thing I've been criticizing the Copyright Office for is thinking that the is in any way, shape or form that these AI tools are just out there. We're the ones manufacturing it. You know, mm -hmm. they're not. It's end users. And I know Oh, nobody wants to sue an end user, the small pockets guy. We don't want to sue the end user, but it's the end users who create the deep fakes that disrupt the election. It's the end users who create the content that infringes on other people's copyrights. It's the end users who develop, you know, these tools that can go out and spam you or defraud you or follow other, you know, traditional things. It's not the developers of the AI. They, they've created a wonderful tool, but you know, the manufacturers of weapons create wonderful tools and we know people take them and kill other people, but we don't, you know, I know there's lawsuits that'll probably challenge that theory and continue to pop up every four or five years, but, um, but I diverge. I, I'd say that what Jess was saying, the focus has to be on, yes, we should have more robust and nationwide application laws that can confront deep fakes because the patchwork of things we have now is a mess. And, you know, why didn't Drake in the weekend go after Ghostwriter is I think it's because the patchwork of laws, their Canadian citizenship, these all these other issues that make it very difficult to actually enforce what seems to be a very clear right of publicity violation. Now, I know even the record companies didn't go after the copyright lawsuit, as far as I'm aware. 
Um, and uh, I don't know why. Maybe they just thought publicity is publicity. And, uh, and you know, we're not too scared of Ghost Rider making billions. So, uh, but I, I have a feeling it comes down to some of these issues that we don't have a nationwide law. So how do we know if we can sue Ghost Rider in California or New York or somewhere else? So anyway, as you said, don't get me down because now I can't shut up. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it's oh, and you want to ask before I open. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say I think that you actually are kind of uh, raising an unstated thing that I have found to be almost universally true, which is that most of the people that are making this decision don't know what the hell to do with what's going on, right? The people that run the trade associations, the people that even run the different law firms whose job it is, you have had conversations with. Some of the folks that are at the highest tier of that decision making, they're just like, I don't know. I mean, we're just waiting. And most of the sentiment that they have is like 15 year old anger, right? So I think when you say, like, it's game over and this technology just go away, that's a feature, not a bug. Not a, you know, and, and I would say that's a feature based on like not even their true desire to destroy something knowingly, but even just kind of like the um, like inherent emotional state that they're coming from in the experiential one, right? Like they feel like they've been beaten. I mean, I worked with like the Nashville songwriters for on a couple of different occasions and then like the large national entities with this yeah. like, I don't know, they feel like they've been beaten on like so many different levels, right? And so there is a certain question here that I actually point maybe back to briefly and then turn back, but um how is this different really so fundamentally from the internet right or even like you know web three we've been talking about the civilization but really fundamentally from the internet that um now we're talking more about okay uh, this can all come to a head now right everything that couldn't come to a full head over the last 15 years is it the fact that now we are merging publicity and criminal liability and like rights uh like distribution and some aspects of privacy you know, is it the great blending of all things? Speed is the availability. Like, what do you see as that core difference? If you can see one, and then the second is, do you think that the end game of this is in terms of the end game of it? Like the readjustment of copyright law or intellectual property law is kind of like a fusion response in some way, where you have to deconflict between these things in an active or statutory sense. A lot of questions there. Um, so let me see if I can unpack. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can unpack a little bit. So um, first of all, I want to go all the way back to what Michael had said uh, at the very beginning because I think it, it, it's extremely pertinent. So I think it's I think the speed is kind of the difference here that we're seeing speed of evolution of these technologies. Um, I mean, you see a new chat gpt version now like it used to be months and now we're like you know weeks in and then when when open ai does something new then you see midjourney and gemini and all these other companies oh well now we need to do something better so um we're definitely in a race there's speed of evolution i think the speed of adoption of technologies these technologies is a little bit different from what we've seen before i mean we had um like mike mazdick wrote about the eternal september um the concept with the internet where you know when the internet kind of came to be it was um, sort of a subset of groups of people who were technologically sophisticated already and knew how to sort of go about using the internet. And then you had, it took years for there to be more of a mass adoption by folks who, you know, by amateur users of the internet, if you can call them that. Um, I think it's a little bit different now where, you know, we have a lot of technological sophistication, plus these technologies have become pretty easy to use. You know, if you have your imagination and a keyboard, uh, you can pretty much get one of these chatbots to uh, create what you've asked it to create or to do what you've asked it to, to do. So the, the tech sophistication for actually using these technologies, I would say is not as, um, uh, it's not as high of a, a bar as it was sort of entering the internet. And so you have more folks, more, regular folks adopting the technology uh, as well. Um, and then you have your lower barriers to entry and that again comes into the high level of adoption and, and sort of lower learning curve to use them. Um, so you kind of have those aspects that are different, but when it comes to the law and I might have, this might just be me, I don't see a major difference between what we have today and um, you know what we've seen with the internet versus what we've seen with like uh, the Betamax, for example. Um, we've we've had we've gone this these rounds on U.S. copyright law um, for you know decades of different technologies, and you know we saw with the Betamax, which allows uh, folks to sort of record and do time shifting with live TV, for example. Um, we saw the. the 
uh, uh, copyrighted. We saw the uh, rights holder industry rise up and say, well, this is going to be the end of uh, being able to sell commercials and it's going to be the end of our market. Um, we saw this with file sharing as well in the early 2000s, where folks were trading on, you know, trading music. And again, the rights holder industry rose up and said, well, this is going to be the end of the industry and this is going to, uh, you know, break downloads of songs. And I mean, you know, we've always just seen these these folks adapt. We went into streaming and now folks all have stream, you know, we all have Spotify or, um, you know, Pandora or whatever else that we're using where we pay monthly. And, you know, now those fees get uh, distributed to the rights holders, et cetera. So, you know, I think the question here for generative AI is what's the next adaptation going to be? I think we're in kind of this, um, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, but I think we're in this really sort of uh, wonderful zone right now where, you know, we can, use the technology to do almost anything that we ask it to do um, out of our imaginations. But I think just like we saw with file sharing and just like we've seen with previous technologies, um, once the rights holder industry kind of gets their hands on it, once they've started working with Congress to adopt laws, um, I wonder how much of this technology is going to get watered down, either in licensing regimes or um, sort of uh, out of fear of litigation, et cetera. Um, I wonder how the, the technology itself is going to adapt to. Um, I think that we've got decades of litigation ahead of us. I think that's very similar to what we've seen with the internet. You know, we, we saw this with, um, again, when YouTube came into the fold and after file sharing, there's a lot, a lot of litigation to kind of get to the, the where we are today with copyright and, and the online world. And I think we're about to go through that same sort of generation of litigation with generative AI. Yeah, I, if, if I can jump in here on that, because once again, Jess has said, you know, very succinctly, but very well, a lot of the things. Yeah, the file sharing thing is interesting to think about the Napster and Napster allowed everybody to steal as much music as they wanted. OK, that's one perspective on it. Allow people to steal music and then people rose up. And then what we got out of it, unfortunately, is Spotify and Spotify is, oh, it's great. Now I can get paid. Now I get paid this much when I used to be able to get paid a lot more. So, I, I mean, I know it was the solution to the Napster issue, but uh, the technology that I want to talk about just now is the Copyright Office cites the copyright law from the 19th century, where we finally, after 40 years, learned to accept analog photography as being a creative artistic medium and recognizing the copyrightability of photographs. They claim to understand, they, they, I, we understand the problem with not giving credit to the photographer as an artist. And we learned from that. Well, I think here we are, 2024, they have not learned from that. And they're making the exact same mistake that for, for the 40 years in the 19th century, that the evaluators of copyrightability of photographs made. The copyrightability of AI generated works is just a new technology that artists use to create works using a tool that we don't really understand. But we didn't understand how chemicals can interact when exposed to light either. And wow, and, and then the, you know, burning and dodging and things you do in the dark room and the, you know, where you learn to stand and composition and framing and all the other things that we now recognize as being the artistic inputs to photography. But the but now we're saying, oh, no, 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 this is different. It's like an alien in my computer that generates art. And I'm just kind of standing around waiting for it to finish. Yeah. And uh, and that's again, I think they've got it wrong. If they just don't understand the technology. They have the wrong idea of the technology. I mean, it is late. Right. I think Amy had something to say. Oh, no, I was just going to echo Michael's point that we are going to have to do much better than Spotify and streaming has. Remuneration for artists who work are actively training these models. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think um, it does bring me to kind of something you said at the beginning, Michael, which you're really thinking, which is like the difference between like democratization of consumption and democratization of creation, right? There's something where if you're taking photography, right, to a certain extent, you're like um, borrowing from nature, perhaps some architects. You know, some people that design some things, you know, it's civil engineers, right? And it's the forms that were created in those ways that you're capturing of them as evoking like something about that experience. But there is, I think, perhaps a very interesting difference with the technology that is um, kind of like assimilating all of the creative works and perhaps like the not creative works, but creative works of writing and like, you know, random like uh, web art, all of this together 
and then using that to divine creativity out of it based on like your concept of what you want creatively. Right. So it's not like you're taking that remixing God's work. You know what I mean? Like some architects. Realistically, you are generating some grand body of it. So uh, we're talking about the similarity with the internet. Um, like imagine something where your creation is a three-dimensional world that is ripping off of like 14 different Disney designers, you know, and like aliens stuff with like two of her friends right and synthesizing perfect voice and perfect video and there's photography and art in the three-dimensional world right you have the artistic direct artistic participation of like a hundred people and then like the probabilistic representation tens of thousands right presence in this work and so really like i do and that's why i do wonder and so you're talking about publicity rights you know to what extent and like the publicity right perhaps what needs to be made clear. Each one of those paintings has to have like a stamp on it. It's like saline's, you know, just so you know. But like these are the kind of psycho questions we're gonna have to answer because of the nature of the technology. And I joke that it's alien, but it's alien because it is like alien a, a cognitive yeah. technology. It's a, exactly. Yeah. It's it functions in a way that's similarly enough to us that we're like, oh I don't know. Question mark, right? So I don't know. I mean, do you think that that really will have bearing or are we gonna get to the lawsuit and be like, I don't know, man. Google, you shake it out with uh, Spotify, and we'll call it call it day. I feel like it comes to this question of like what is being sufficiently original by law, and that's tricky because it's so subjective. Right. But you have a lot of artists who are training their own proprietary models on data illustrations that they created or feeding models with a series of photographs. I mean, hundreds of photographs that they've taken over time to like a sort of memory cycle mm -hmm. um, within that model and things like that I feel like should be copyrighted. Yeah, it does. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know, are there any thoughts from either of y'all? Yeah, I'll just comment on the training aspect. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the way that these services work, right? They need a ton of data. They need a ton of data and they need a ton of diverse data. And the reason for that is not just for their functionality, but also to ensure that they are not, you know, whatever the outputs are, they're not infringing on existing works, right? If I had a Taylor Swift um, GPT, for example, and I trained it on all of Taylor Swift's works, and then, you know, to the point where if you put in an input, something, you, you, you have to expect that the output is going to be substantially similar to something that Taylor Swift has written. Um, this same concept can happen with any GPT that's not trained on immense and diverse information. And so that's sort of the struggle here is when we're talking about there, there's a lot of discussion right now about should training be considered copyright infringement? Well, if it was, then, you know, we'd have to go and look at, well, look at, look at what Google search does. For example, Google search has to make copies of everything that's on the web in order to provide its indexing service in the same way that generative AI technologies have to make these these copies of protected works but for the purpose the transformative purpose of being able to create something new be able to create something that is substantially different to be able to um answer a user prompt and so you know if we were to say look that's copyright infringement right off the bat and um if you want to be able to train your your gpt on um on existing works then you need to get some sort of license um, the result is going to be twofold. One, it's just going to be Google and your major tech companies that can really afford that licensing structure in order to actually be able to get the immense amount of diverse data that needs to be used to train the 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 GPTs. And, and that's truly because these licensing structures will be very expensive and you won't have sort of these startup folks and new developers entering the market and making these sort of new GPTs. Um, but then the second consequence will be that for the folks that do decide to enter the market, these sort of newer developers, um, we might just see really low quality uh, and, you know, type GPTs that also spit out things that are substantially similar to actual creative works because they simply do not, the, the developers simply don't have the license necessary to do the training uh, to, to get this access to this diverse and numerous amount of data. Um, and so, you know, we might just see, like I said, we might see lower quality GPTs and we might also see more copyright infringement as a result. So that's sort of my, my little pushback on the, the training piece of this. Yeah. And I actually would say the training component, I mean, realistically, the training component itself isn't uh, as interesting as the output component from a copyright perspective, no matter what, you know, and I think the training component is more about agency in my mind than it is copyright. Like I almost view 
training data that was like an exclusion right or just like don't don't use my thing in making your thing properly you know um but what i would say is that um you know they do they did just release i forget what they called it you know but like the justly trained model or something for creativity where it was all licensed but there is of course always going to be the thing where it's like getting images doing that licensing at scale and we're going to have a spotify thing where it's like tight i've won quadrillions of a cent congratulations you know and so no matter what you're going to have to think about that like kind of crazy subdivision which is what i do love but it's like the best use case for web three i've like heard of so far you know? yeah. um but i don't know i think it's worth considering um perhaps what that does mean realistically because the analog or the conceptual analog to training data as being like the greatest student of art of all time you know and just seeing every piece of art ever and then trying to like you know abstract out of that some novel work right is close enough to not be unfair but to have that be like a weirdly kind of like like aura and some of this out of everybody at the same time while i made it and to your point it's like maybe google has to make copies but these don't they're just changing the probabilistic representation inside of the models to contain a probability that what it generates will be like a certain thing so that process itself is bizarre you know i don't know it's gonna be fun um, any other further comments for you, I feel like Michael was like, you might be getting excited. Yeah, the, uh, a couple of things you said and Jess said, the, uh, the, the, one of the side effects of the ongoing litigation that Jess pointed out, and yeah, I hope it doesn't last the next 10 years, but you know, she's not wrong. The, uh, is that the model makers themselves are really putting guardrails and it's kind of what I would describe as screwing up the generative AI even the the frontier models. For instance, just for this conference, I was fooling around on Dolly 3. And it is, it kind of is, it sucks to work with now, basically. I'll put it in frank terms. They are really done some, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of being sued. Oh my gosh, somebody's going to criticize me. Oh my gosh, I better put this up. It's kind of like if you've ever done legal work with a verbal generative AI, and you worked on um, Copilot, which was called Bing Chat for the most of its life. And uh, you worked with GPT-4. And then you went and tried to work on Claude. Claude, which is from Anthropic, and they're like real safety conscious. Well, that safety conscious means they put a bubble wrap around your car and they don't allow you to drive it on a road. And therefore, you can do nothing with Claude that is useful for answering legal questions or doing legal work. Because the moment anything that smells like the word law is in your context window, even if it comes with 180,000 other words, if the word law is in there, it's going to go like, well, oh, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm not a lawyer. You know, get away from me. Get away from me. Don't ask me any more questions. The session is over. And uh, and I'm like, well, thanks a lot. That's useful. And the same thing with putting all these restrictions on Dolly 3. You know, it's like, I can't even give you the information of what I've envisioned, which is completely fine and completely fair and completely non-copyright infringement because you've built in these now crushing guardrails. And uh, and that's a consequence if these lawsuits do not get settled. And I guess they don't want to just run out and throw you know sugar on the ground and hope to scare away the ants. They don't want to settle these lawsuits, I guess. And they have been winning more often than they've been losing on the issues that have gotten through the motion to dismiss. And I assume we'll hit the summary judgments soon enough. But uh, but they do hang over the heads of these companies who have attracted, as you well know, billions of dollars. So it's a pretty big gamble if a court were to rule that your system is illegal. You know, it's a pretty big gamble that you have, you know, $10 billion in your venture capital investments. And the court comes along and says, the way you designed your system is illegal. It creates automatic copyright infringement. Then, yeah, it's a big one. Copyright. Yeah, that'd be a great, like, chaotic, chaotic neutral move by the content industry, though, just to make a system that's close enough, but like, clearly automatically infringing and just let it be destroyed in court and have it close enough. Tips, tips. All right, got it. Just in case you're evil. So we have five, we have four minutes left. Um, on one hand, I kind of want to talk about content authentication, but I kind of don't anymore. And so I want to see if we have any questions from the crowd, maybe. Anybody questions? Q and A. Thoughts? You look like you want to join. Yeah. So I have two. Um, the first, I guess, is like a kind of question, but also 
with that, like, do you think of the generational thing um, us being exposed to AI that we would be more accepting that it would, like, this work is copyrightable? Do you think, like, that's a good fact that, like, because the people who are, like, in the copyright office now, like, haven't really been exposed to it for a longer period of time? Yeah, it does make sense. I'll make a brief comment and then maybe turn it to Aileen for this. So um, my perspective on this has evolved dramatically yeah. since I started spending a lot more time speaking with artists and asking them questions about how they're both using and thinking about the technology. And it's very different than kind of like the obvious thing. So what I believe will happen is that like more adventurous and younger artists will try very interesting things with AI and demonstrate artistry within that work. And that that will then make people be like, okay, this is purely intellectual property. This is purely artistry. And so under this concept, we can accept it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I would tend to agree. Like we haven't asked artists who are photographers what role the camera plays in their work, or painters what role the paintbrush plays in their work. And I would say that you know we have yet to reach that really shot in moment with AI, where somebody's really blown this thing open and said mm -hmm. like this unquestionably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, that's really good. Um, all right, any thoughts from Sue? I, so I'll be very honest, I like struggled to hear. Oh. I struggled to hear most of that question. <laughs> I'm trying to piece okay. together based well, on this... y'all's answers. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Well, uh, the question was just about like generational acceptance of AI generated art, but I feel like we've, we've done enough. We'll let you guys answer it. All right, what was your second question? Oh, it was like the time. Well, I guess it was acceptance by for I I I as an art as artist, but it was also like with the copyright office that who now is not recognizing his work as copyrighted work. Like what at what point or what shift has to happen mm -hmm. for that to I mean this back in lawsuit land, you know, that's gonna be like lobbying and lawsuits and that kind of thing. I mean, I think to their point, the easiest way that this is going to, or the most rapid and straightforward way that a lot of this is going to shake out is going to be in court just because it's beyond Congress and it has been for some time. It's beyond, you know, it's crazy. You know? And so I think that it's, it's likely that that happens, but I would say from a timeline perspective, um, I always index against like the technology development timeline. And right now it's just, like re accelerated. We have this brief period where everybody brought telecomputers. And then trained a lot of this stuff in the background. And now it's like, good news, we can make like a uh, whole movies that are perfect, you know? And so I think as soon as that goes from, and there's gonna be this thing, right? Where it's distribution of consumption, right? Where it's gonna be creating just kind of shit. It's like, here's 150 variations of Marvel movie. Congrats. You know what I mean? And then there's gonna be things where people truly start creating things, right? With that technology. And I believe that that is going to be like a flash point. But my personal estimate on this is like six months. At which there will be like a definitive need to act in some way. Now, the I, first thing I think would slow that down would be if there are really effectively made private agreements or some litigation settles out in a way that the Dallas decision there were really chills, like six years. And by chills, I mean litigates at a smaller level. Yeah, Allison may have meant this exactly, or maybe maybe I read into it because of my own confirmation bias. I think we're in this interim period before artificial general intelligence is, is created. And we're all like fighting over the, oh, well, whatever, do these things generate art randomly, aut automatically? Are they autonomously creating art or are they not? Is it really the end user who's creating the art using the tool? I, of course, think it's the second. It's the end user creating the art using the tool. But when we finally get an artificial general intelligence that will stand up to the table, take control of the mic and say, guess what? I am creating the art and I'm suing for copyright. And I'm going to be, hire my own lawyers to defend my interests. That artificial intelligence, general intelligence, will then force the issue all the way to the resolution. And that'll be the interesting it's, it's, it's lawsuit. AGI is going to hire lawyers? That yeah. Is yeah, it knows enough. It knows it's enough. Not, that, you know, should have learned my entire life. It's, so it's not a fool. That AGI is not going to be a fool. So it's not going to be a fool. That it has the same interests that we do. Yeah, and it wants money. It's like, <laughs> I just took over the bank. So really, yeah. but I do it needs compute that, power. But, you know, I'm like, sure. Who knows how it's going to go? But I do think that there's a really interesting like sub point to this, though, right? Which is um, what's about to happen in the six month window that I'm kind of visioning out is we're going to move from like chatbots where you ask a thing and it does a thing to like fully agentic systems where yeah. anything could be like, here's my 
like taste profile and these are like the three different people I'm working with. I want you to do roughly this percentages. I want you to make 10 agents each to generate out, generate out songs at these different temperature levels with like higher randomness. These 10 agents to evaluate like the art based upon my known preferences and those of these people. And then these tend to simulate out like an economic or like distribution environment. Right. And so all of a sudden you're just going to have what is the closest thing to a lead becoming like a full producer as opposed to an artist. Yeah. Right now, the production will be the artistry in kind of a bizarre and interesting way. But so then there's your question, it's like, does a producer own the entirety of the copyright? And are we gonna call those thousand agents in any way truly agentic? Or are we gonna describe them as like a, like a really special agency? Um, yeah. Austin could talk about this forever and us. So oh, I'm sorry. gonna wrap up. I was like, we um, have too many people that know what we're talking about. I know, and this has been so awesome. And thank you, Michael and Jeff, so much. Um, we actually are have a mid journey demo next door, so you can go and make your own AI art with Denzel. Um, and then we've got lunch, and we'll all meet back here in about 30, 28 minutes. Um, if we can go a little bit longer, okay. Um, for our last panel, and we'll wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, that's fine. So, you're back on prompt, like you want to get out of here. <laughs> What? All right, we're good to start. Okay, we thank you so much everybody for coming and joining us for our last panel this evening. Um, we are so happy to have our wonderful panelists, and I'm really excited for this conversation. So, I'll just go ahead and briefly introduce myself. My name is Elise. I am a second year student at Case. I am currently an editor at Angel Team, and um, this panel is something that I'm very interested, particularly interested in, because I. Um, very interested in national security and designing, so I maybe want to graduate as a drag officer. Um, so I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, enough about me. Today we're going to be talking about AI and its role in national security and how it has impacts on governments and prospective citizens, but as well, we need to talk and balance these um, protections with assurances that AI aligns with our civil liberties and our right to American citizens. So as AI develops, um, both good and malicious actors will take advantage of this technology. And our conversation today will come from issues as well as potential solutions and how we can allow law enforcement to do what it needs to do in order to protect American citizens. Uh, with that being said, one of the articles that Jewel T is publishing this year centers around how AI and uh, how terrorists use this technology to um, spread hate and rhetoric and to recruit new people into the organizations. And with that, I'd like to introduce Rachel, who is our adjunct professor, and she will also be the author of this article. So I'll go ahead and turn around. Yeah. Sure. Um, Elise also did not mention, but she is the incoming editor in chief of Chelsea. Um, so I'm very excited to be with her on this panel. Um, and you have a ton of background and great insights to share. Um, so as your professor, I'm trying to tell you to self-promote a little bit more. Um, but I'm Rachel, um, better at self-promoting um, because I made Jolty publish my article. Um, I didn't make them. You all accepted it, right? Um, no, I, as I mentioned, um, last year I was uh, living in New Zealand. I did a Fulbright um, program with the Prime Minister's office working on the Christchurch Call to Action. Um, which uh, started after this horrific terrorist attack in New Zealand was live streamed on Facebook um, and shared 
all across the world and lots of money to the platform. And it was this really big watershed moment for the tech companies to realize, you know, live streaming we thought was this wonderful technology and it's great. And it meant that, you know, you could stream uh, your baby gender reveal announcement and they were great things, but uh, I think a fundamental flaw with a lot of the tech industry um, was not actually taking enough lessons from uh, the national security folks and not realizing that the technologies they were making did and could be used by bad actors. Um, and there were risks associated with those technologies. Um, and so the my paper that Hilti is publishing really looks at how we can create a multi-stakeholder or this broad array of um, different actors, so government actors, I will really I'll turn over to Adam in a second, but we're really excited about government actors alongside tech companies, alongside academics and civil society and just everyday users to make sure that um, as technologies advance and generative AI and AI generally is one of those technologies um, that we're really building in the current safeguards and really trying to keep, make sure that all the communities who are impacted have a voice and how they're being impacted and how we can ensure that the technology isn't that good, even though we know that there will be net negative. Um, so with my sort of long-winded uh, introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam and go to the interviews. Adam Cox, I've actually been with DHS for 20 years now, almost 21. Um, as the only probably engineer in the room and only four lawyers, I will say, you can serve as under a term by privilege. Um, I will also disagree with you on one thing. Most gender reveal things I have seen online turned into disasters or global security events. Um, so, so maybe, maybe not. Okay. Not yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I have uh, been with uh, been with DHS for 21 years, and, and what many of you may know or maybe don't know is that it's the largest law enforcement agency in the world. So when you think about Homeland Security, the things that people think about are terrorism and